Good morning, everyone. It's just past 9am Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. Welcome to the Unshackled's Marriage Law Postal Survey Results live stream, which is live on the Unshackled's Facebook page. You're here with uh, Tim Wilms, Editor-in-Chief of the Unshackled, Amelia Garcia from Front and Centre Podcast. Nice to be with you all. And also uh, Dave Palau from uh, Palau Talk. Good morning, everyone. How are you? So we will know the results at uh, 10 a.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time, which is uh, less than an hour away. So I thought what we do for the first hour while we uh, count down to the results. Uh, so we'll start from the beginning, which is the, the movement for, for a public vote, because this debate has been uh, going on for oh, probably more than a decade now. And it came about because there's been a total of 22 bills uh, proposed in the Australian Parliament this century, which have been uh, defeated uh, every time. So the, the attitude was, if you, know, you don't like the, the Parliament's decision, let's put it to the public. That was pretty much it. It was, um, yeah, the, the legislation was, was proposed. Uh, sorry, the, the definition of marriage was confirmed um, in, uh, was it 2004? And uh, over the subsequent 13 years, there have been well over 20 um, times where the various people, the, the homosexual lobby has attempted to redefine marriage and every single time the multiple parliaments that have rejected that opportunity and invitation um, hasn't been ignored. It's been a, a constant war of attrition ever since then. So they thought they'd try something different. Yeah. I mean, if you look at it, truly, uh, one, of the, one of the biggest issues that I see with the uh, plebiscite really has nothing to do with uh, anything uh, relating to the definition of marriage itself. It's more to do that we're hyping up this movement as if it were something binding, as if, as if this plebiscite actually meant that, you know, day after tomorrow, gay marriage will definitively be either uh, legal or not legal, which is not the case. It's really just a glorified opinion poll. I mean, it's just yeah. the government putting an opinion poll on Facebook at an enormous scale, right? So yeah. that's really one of the issues that I have. Uh, I think I differ with you a little bit about the uh, the definition of marriage. Honestly, I think that it's uh, it's been something that's been changing uh, constantly throughout uh, throughout the the centuries. Really, the only thing uh, kind of being uh, the standard being obviously a man and a woman. But again, things change over and over. But when it comes that's to a, the, it's a good standard. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I, I think I have a different view on that. However, I will say that when it comes to the to the plebiscite uh, and everyone kind of losing their mind over, uh, you know, vote yes and virtue signaling or vote no, it's the most dangerous thing that can ever happen to a society. Uh, it's not really binding. It's all just kind of uh, politicians hiding behind the facade of letting the people make the decision for them and then being able to hide behind this wall saying any decision we made, we made because people told us to. Yeah. They have... Uh, obviously, there has been, you know, numerous opinion polls over over, over the years on, on the issue of same-sex marriage. But uh, I, I disagree that you know this is just another opinion poll because this is it's a, a confidential uh, poll, uh, and it'll include. It's not just a sample of one thousand, two thousand Australians. It's as we know, turnout. Uh, was cl uh, was close to eighty percent, which is around mm. um, off the top of my head around twelve million votes. So we will, you know, once and for all, know where the Australian people stand on this issue. I don't know that. Um, look, definitely that's the case. I, I've got some reservations about the quality of of the survey because you know there wasn't a i don't think there was an adequate lead up time prepper the the no campaign i i think was caught less than adequately prepared uh for a campaign and what we saw was that they were fast gaining ground that the yes campaign was losing at least in the early stages something like a million votes a week where as the No campaign was able to prepare its and present its arguments and, and insert the concerns that have been confirmed uh, in the last few hours where they're going, what, freedom of religion? No, you can't have that. That's increasing discrimination. <laughs> 
Well, well, that's what we've been saying the whole time, and that's the case we were trying to put. And and really, you know, the the very short lead-in time we had before the vote, voting even started uh, made it very hard to give people an informed vote. Um, and lots of people were voting out of of how the mainstream media and uh, the the group think was telling them to to vote. Um, and and yeah, there's. Um, there's plenty of room to to say. Look, if we had have had another month, we probably could have tipped the scales even further, um, because they were tipping rapidly, and um, it was causing them a great deal of concern. The the yes campaigners. Uh, I think, and I'll take a, a little bit of a different view. Although I do agree with you that uh, that the vote no campaign was uh, incredibly inadequate in in how they were um, kind of handling their their uh, their message is that mm. I don't think that they really put forward the conservative messages and the ones that are appropriate to kind of keep the institution of marriage as it is. Uh, I, I heard a lot of sensationalism coming from uh, the Vote No campaign, also a lot of anecdotal evidence. Uh, for example, when this uh, woman said that a, do- uh, a teacher told her child that he could wear a dress if he wanted to, which uh, I'm sorry, but your anecdotal uh, little story isn't really enough to to uh, make people decide to vote one way or another. So I think that if the vote no campaign had been a little bit more um, honest and had stuck a little bit more with with the actual real uh, conservative arguments for uh, traditional marriage, they would have done a better job. However, what you see on the vote yes side really is that they just had the uh, the the people behind them in all of the big cities. I mean, if you see where the where the um, population is concentrated in Australia, they tend to be pretty um, open-minded in terms of, uh, of gay marriage. And so I think that's why you gained a lot of momentum in, in, in all of these places. You know, just a lot of people, a lot of younger people who just uh, kind of grew up with the concept of homosexuality, maybe the way that uh, a lot of older people didn't. And for them, uh, the, the concept of gay marriage isn't as uh, far out and they don't really see it as much of a shift as maybe some other people will see it and kind of maybe have some opinions about the institution of marriage itself. Mm-hmm. Well, let's uh, talk a bit about how we got, uh, got to this uh, stage. So the plebiscite, it was originally going to be a compulsory attendance plebiscite. It was per- first right. proposed following the... Uh, joint coalition party room meeting in, I believe it was around August 2015, just before Tony Abbott was deposed as Prime Minister, they decided against a uh, a conscience vote and instead uh, decided that they would put it to the people. Obviously, Malcolm Turnbull then became Prime Minister and part of the deal to become Prime Minister was that he would stick to this plebiscite, which he took to the 2016 election, which the coalition just won. The compulsory attendance plebiscite was rejected by the Senate in late 2016. Then it was put on the, the back burner for the first half of 2017, and we uh, didn't hear much of it. But it was actually put back on the agenda, I think, first by Peter Dutton, who suggested going down this uh, postal vote. And then there was the, the push by the uh, gay liberal MPs, uh, plus a few others, uh, to uh, have a free vote. And... Then there was another um, party room meeting where I believe it was about eight uh, Liberal MPs uh, voted in favour of the free vote. And then that, that's when the, the party room decided they would go down the, the route of the, the postal survey run by the Australian Bureau of Statistics. I mean, curiously enough, one of the things that I thought was, was, uh, was pretty funny when it comes to uh, how they handled the the plebiscite is that uh, people on the yes side were losing their shit completely because uh, they said that basically sending it through the mail was suppressing the the youth's vote, and that you know apparently millennials millennials are just way too stupid to be oh, able to open an God, envelope, take a box, that. and send like, it back. So insulting. <laughs> it was so stupid. I know, right? Yeah, I think you, you'd think that a generation as um, self-centered as ours would be a little more proud. But I think that it turns out that actually uh, doing it at this scale and doing it through postal may have led the way and may I have actually put uh, the Yes campaign at an advantage. I don't know what you think. Why do you think it 
put the Yes campaign at an advantage? I mean, clearly people do know how to use those red shiny things in, in every second street block, but where does the... Uh, I'm just I'm not disagreeing with you, but I'm, I'm just curious where you think the advantage came from. I think the scale and just kind of having it going directly to every uh, single uh, eligible voter is what I meant by 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 the um, advantage. Okay. I think the the only thing that we that we could have had a disadvantage of I would I shouldn't say we because I'm I, I don't really like identifying with the yes campaign because it's just so virtue signally. But um, but yeah, I think I think if you if you kind of identify the the um, the scale at which people are voting now because of of the postal aspect of it, I think that it just it just reached so many more yes voters. I actually think that that actually gave it a uh, a far better chance at, at, at passing. Yeah, interesting. I one of my biggest complaints about right of center um, peers is um, that they're incredibly apathetic. Um, that it, it takes a heck of a lot to to get conservatives and libertarians politically organised. We just turn up on election day um, because we have to, and uh, and because we want to. But you know, uh, volunteering and and all those other things, debating and and you know, you, you said um, that the current generation has pretty much grown up with homosexuality, and and that's because the left has been waging this campaign for decades. Um, inserting the normalization of homosexuality into mainstream culture has been a decades long um, you know s- strategy and it 's obviously you know paying results in in a handful of countries around the world now out of out of the hundreds of countries there are there 's maybe one or two dozen I think that have um, uh, recognized officially recognized homosexual marriages. And they're predominantly Western countries because of the the saturation of Western culture um, with this normalization. Um, and you know, there's nothing new about homosexuality. It was yeah. it was certainly around, you know, in Roman times and and obviously older. But um, this is the first age, the first age of of humanity and, and history where it's been considered a normal platform for a household um, in, in law. Um, it's the first time in, in law or culture. Um, it's, it's been around, but it's never been considered the foundation of a family. And, mm. um, and you know, normalising what's historically obscure, if not un, unseen anywhere, other than Nero, who was far from a normal person, um, was... Um, yeah, this this campaign that's been going for a long time, and and so the the apathy of of conservatives, like it's only when the votes announced that um, we actually tend to to come together. If there's a really good thing that has come out of this, re- regardless of the result, mm. it's that it's <clears> probably <throat> probably been this an actually un, almost unprecedented mm. mobilisation of previously apathetic people that that conservatives and Christians have now woken up and going, hey. We're losing the culture war, and mm. we can't observe from the sidelines anymore. We actually have to care and act and speak and say no and think for ourselves. But, um, yeah, the the postal vote, um, I guess young people generally are, so having it apathetic, so having it sent directly to them um, yeah. has, yeah, would, would definitely give a little bit more of a prod um, to to those to those younger people, right? And uh, I mean, kind, kind of uh, getting back to what you were saying a little bit about uh, the culture war and everything. I think conservatives right now, uh, among uh, other things, among some of the changes that are that they're making, have just become a little bit more comfortable with the idea of homosexuality. It seems like more mainstream conservatives just really uh, not not maybe they don't champion for gay rights, but I don't think I don't think uh, most uh, mainstream conservatives have any problems with homosexuality, homosexual uh, people kind of just living their own lives. And uh, sure. the Unshackled's um, platform is also, it's conservative, but it's also libertarian. And from a libertarian point of view, I think that's where homosexual, uh, sorry, uh, gay marriage is probably the most, um, it, it probably fits in the most there. Essentially, why should the government be regulating what is a legal binding, legally binding contract between two consenting adults? If I want to go ahead and sign a document with uh, Charlie or with Anne, 
uh, why is it the government to come in and say, all right, let me just check your genitals, and if they're compatible, then you can go ahead and sign that. Uh, so from a libertarian point of view, I feel like that's uh, that's where it kind of lands. I don't know what you think, Tim, because you're a little bit more on the libertarian side. In terms of uh, what the... what the Getting government out of... Yeah. yeah, kind of getting government out of marriage altogether. Uh, yeah, well, I... I consider myself a libertarian and so that is the libertarian dream to have you know government you know not involved in marriage because they originally weren't i mean just look at australia we didn't have a marriage act until 1961 so uh, it's always been a uh, societal uh, institution but i was always of the opinion that uh, marriage doesn't belong to the government and so i think it was fair to you know ask the australian people you know what how they wanted you know marriage defined rather than leave it up to uh, 226 uh, members of parliament who you know vote uh, deciding on you know which 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 way they got out of bed in the morning so i think that it gives the people once again ownership of the the institution absolutely and what i will say um dave is that i do i do understand and i think that sometimes we've become a little bit too apathetic to some of the institutions that have uh created um, that have created the society that we know and the reason that we live in a Western a liberal society that, uh, that we can be so proud to, uh, to be free and have uh, freedom of speech and all these things. Um, however, I don't know if, uh, if recognizing the, um, the origins and what has, what has advanced all of these uh, ideals means that we can't change certain fundamental parts of it. So in other words, I, I totally understand that the institution of marriage is uh, is a very important part of what has created society. I just don't know if I think that uh, changing the definition will do all that much to um, to affect the the culture that's already been established. I don't know what you think of that. Um, look, the the march of Marxism through the institutions is always a, a march of inches. Um, and you know they'll they'll perhaps ask for ten inches and then concede nine, um, right. and, and it's always this this little bit of ground, a little bit of ground, a little bit of ground, and you know so mm. homosexual marriage isn't the thin end of the wedge; it's the thick end of the wedge. This is this has been advancing for a long time. Um, you know what will it change? Well, look what it what it cha- and this is why libertarians should be opposed to homosexual marriage is because it isn't just between two adults. Um, The Universal Declaration of Human Rights establishes that marriage is a compound right to create a household and to have children. You Mm. you can't separate those two things from each other. I'm all for gay rights, 100%. I want every gay person to have every right that I have. Um, But again, you know the claim that marriage is a human right, uh, that homosexual marriage is a human right, is a false one. It's not a religious opinion. That's a legal opinion, and it's a legal assertion that it's a human right. And they never actually say on what basis they claim this human right. But the European Court of Human Rights, arguably the most secular, progressive court, and the furthest thing from religious in the world, has constantly concluded that homosexual marriage is not a human right. And, you know, there's been lots of homosexual activists who have have fought for it and they've lost because it's simply not true. It's nothing more than a claim and repeating it over and over and over doesn't, doesn't make it true. So the reality is that it is a compound right when it is extended to homosexuals and there are only so many kids up for adoption that the rate of adoption in australia is incredibly low and there is only so many altruistic surrogates who are you know willing willing to do that there's just not that many people who are willing to do that voluntarily and so to satisfy that compound right we necessarily will see an increase in the demand and call for legalisation of commercial surrogacy. And nations around the world have outlawed this. And the nations where, you know, some of the poorer Asian nations um, have seen the the commercial, the commodification of women mm. and children um, via commercial surrogacy. And it's, it's, it's a terrible thing. Um, and the impacts on children to be necessarily denied a a relationship with their biological mother or father to satisfy the emotional needs of adults 
is mm. is a competition of rights between children and gay adults, and I don't think we should ever put children's needs, who are defenceless and voiceless, um, second to anybody else's. That's where that's where I would push back a little bit because uh, I would say that when we're talking about defenseless children and children who are, uh, I agree with you on the surrogacy part. I think that uh, if there are uh, a ton of kids in uh, miserable situations in uh, that have no um, no no parents, basically to provide them with uh, the the right to have a mother or father. Uh, whatever to basically give them some unconditional love. Uh, why would we be creating some some artificial uh, children on the side? So uh, I can I can agree with you on that. What I don't really agree with is uh, thinking that perhaps it's better to not allow uh, two uh, parents of the same sex to adopt a kid and instead keep instead keep them in a situation where. Uh, they have n no one once they turn 18, and that's why mm. we see such high rates of uh, criminality and um, substance abuse and things like this, because they never grew up with that uh, unconditional love that two parents can can provide. So I'm mm. not sure if... Uh, so I understand your, your point of view when it comes to a traditional family. I just don't think that it's um, necessarily the best thing for the children that don't have parents for uh, us to be stepping in and saying, well, I'm sorry you're not going to have parents because we want to protect you from the evils of having two uh, parents that are the same sex. I, I just really don't agree with that. See, what, um... No, I... I... Hmm? Sorry, I'll let you go in a second, Tim. I'll be real okay. brief. Amelia, I, I agree with you. The best interests of children should always preside. And, and if a homosexual adoptive couple... Um, wanted to adopt a child who otherwise would have no other options other than institutionalization, um, I'd be all, all behind um, the homosexual couple being able okay. to adopt. But wherever possible, a child should be afforded their biological mother and father, and if not biological, then at least a mother and father. And if that's not possible, then any two loving parents will do in that third scenario. Fair enough. Sorry, Tim. Sorry for interrupting you, Tim. Uh, th the thing that, you know, uh, the reason why, like, I understand, uh, you know, your uh, concerns about, you know, uh, children uh, a day, but the thing that, like, is, is always the, the, the biggest uh, issue for me is that I don't like it when, you know, governments say that you can't do something. And, and, and this is why, th this is probably why, you know, I came down more on the, on the side of allowing same sex marriage because I didn't like the fact that the you know the government said you know you can't uh, you can't get married and, and it's also the reason why right. yes there there are concerns you know for the uh, welfare of children but I just don't think it's it, it, it's not it's not a, a black and white issue where children are you know automatically one hundred percent worse off with you know, with uh, a same same sex couple, and so I I, I yeah. always put it in the the point of view that I don't think it's the best use of you know government you know resources to you know go and raid an you know IVF clinic because they're, um, <laughs> uh, they're, they're because they're providing um, fertility to lesbians, for example. I just I just don't think that should be a priority for government. Look, um, what you what you've inferred. Either it's not always 100% worse off, is essentially hard cases, um, and and we don't. And the the old adage is hard cases make ba bad law. The the assertion is on average. It, it's mm -hmm. it, there is no assertion that it's 100% worse off. Of course not. And because this so often needs to be said, um, I'm going to say what shouldn't need saying, and that is that nobody, certainly not me, nobody I know is arguing that homosexuals make bad parents. That's not the case at all. Um, in fact, I've heard plenty of people um, argue that heterosexuals make bad parents, and I think that's an absurd claim. Yeah. Um, but I I'm not saying that homosexuals make bad parents. What mm. the claim is, is, is that gold standard research um, with a large representative sample uh, actually shows that, on average, children do best when raised by their biological married parents. Now, all things being equal, we should always try and provide that environment 
for for children we should always like we said before act in the best interests of children so it's not a claim that it's always going to be worse it's a claim that it's on average going to going to be best for children to be raised by their biological parents and we shouldn't be deliberately creating scenarios where the natural rights of a child to their biological parents are inevitably deliberately going to be denied uh, without any other circumstance like abuse or those things which we should be mm. intervening in as well and and so yeah it's not it's not that they're always 100 percent worse clearly clearly we can think of hard cases and anecdotes and personal experience where it's been mm. the opposite where a heterosexual parent has been abusive and a homosexual parent has been fantastic of course we're going to be able to come up with those things huh. but unlike death divorce and desertion um deliberately denying a child from one of their natural parents look the sociology has shown for decades that wherever a child grows up with broken biological relationships the outcomes are on average worse for them and i think it's a basic duty of care which which is the premise for when governments should get involved even to libertarianism it, it's we're not believers in anarchy we're believers in limited government involvement and when should government get involved it's when we need protecting from other people and and things that we can't provide for ourselves. And that's certainly the case with children, that we should get involved when it's predictable. <clears throat> it's 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 highly, highly likely that any child with a broken biological relationship is going to have worse mental health, worse emotional health, worse study outcomes. Mm. Um, these things happen on average, not exclusively. You, you know, it might be an 80 percent rate. It doesn't matter. It's it's not a universal claim that they're doomed or anything else like that. But it's just a duty of care that we have as legislators, as voters on legislation, as voters on government, that we do the best we can for the children. And creating a less than ideal outcome is not something we should be deliberately doing. Right. Uh, I, I'm curious, though, if I may, uh, just because I, I think maybe I misunderstood you. Uh, I don't think that there's an organized push to deny children their natural uh, born parents and I do agree with you that I mean the the research so shows overwhelmingly that two parent households just tend to deliver the best results by far I mean yeah. just I mean in, in almost every rubric um, however I do understand uh, and the whole thing that you were saying about surrogacy uh, before and uh, I, I get that but at the same time I really don't see an organized push to deny uh, a child their two biological parents so I, I want to know a little bit more about what you meant by that. I, I mean that it's inevitable, um, that it's it's predictable and it's observable in, in other jurisdictions where this experiment is, is further down the track. Um, there's no organised push. It, it's, it, yeah, it, it's just the inevitability of the compound right of marriage to be married and form a family um, under mm -hmm. the universal... United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. That's a compound right. You get one, you get both, and mm. and that's and that's um, it's an inevitability. It's a foreseeable consequence, and and all legislation should be considered very carefully with the foreseeable consequences in mind. And um, yeah, I mean, what we're what we're essentially argue, what what the Yes campaign has essentially been arguing as their major um, logic for redefining marriage is feelings and fair. And right. so if, if somebody has feelings that they want a child and they're in a right. relationship which biologically prohibits that, they mm. necessarily have to find a child and deprive them of a biological relationship um, when adopted children and voluntary surrogacy um, is, is no longer an option. And, you know, and the fair test is, well, it's not fair to deny heter homosexual people marriage when heterosexuals get to enjoy it. The next fair test will be by the same standard and by the same logic being consistent. It's not mm. fair to deny homosexual people children when heterosexual people get to have children. And these are irrational um, arguments that just, that just don't stack up. So there's not an organised push for depriving children of parents it's just a foreseeable natural flow on consequence of of this inch that has been gained 
Okay, so oh. there's less than half an hour to go now until the to the results. If, uh, normally on these live streams, time uh, tends to go really quickly, but because we're anticipating uh, a result, time right. is going very slowly. Um, we, we haven't had a, uh, a an announcement like this because the the head of the ABS will come with a bit of paper in the hand since the of the the 2015 lead, leadership spill when we were all waiting for you know just uh, finding out who the the prime minister was but let's talk about the the campaign uh, itself now mm. they got off to a bit of a shaky start there were um you know stories of mail theft um and then there was also the the high court challenge um uh, because the money for the survey wasn't appropriated by uh parliament um, uh, the, the High Court uh, uh, rejected that and oh. said that the survey could uh, go ahead. It didn't start well for the, the Yes Pardon. campaign. They appear to be uh, triggered by any opposing views. Uh, there was oh, yeah. a lot of uh, you know, intimidating counter-protests. You remember that one uh, at, a, I think it was a church in, in Brisbane. <clears throat> and then there was also the, the fake uh, posters, where, uh, uh, which was uh, put up in Melbourne. So, uh, yeah, they didn't get off to a good start. The, uh, the, the fake protest in, in Brisbane was hilarious because... because um, it just revealed so much about the lies of the Yes campaign. They did not do themselves uh, any favours with that at all. Um, the the meeting that they protested, the the um, marriage redefinition advocates, the Yes campaign, they they stormed. The, I think it was Socialist Alliance from the UQ campus, um, University of Queensland campus. Um, which a revealed the Marxist agenda behind the Marxist interest in uh, in pushing for redefinition of marriage, but b the the meeting was actually about safe schools, and their claim was that safe schools mm. and redefining marriage were completely unrelated. This is a one dimensional um, a one dimensional debate, one dimensional question, and any. Uh, assertion that safe schools would be a consequence of redefining marriage was a red herring as they were completely unrelated. And then they turned up protesting uh, against the safe schools thing as as the yes campaigners. I was like, hang on, I thought you said there was there was no relation. <laughs> Secondly, thirdly, the whole event was cancelled altogether because the police basically said, cancel it, we can't assure you of safety at all from the yes campaigners. And so we'd just rather you didn't have your event um, squashing and muting the the free speech and political expression that was intended to have by the, the no campaign um, or by the um, safe schools um, right. concerned groups. Um, and the only people that did turn up that night were a bunch of elderly parishioners for a parish finance meeting. And, and then these clowns, um, threw themselves in front of cars on the road and claimed that they'd been run over, um, and yeah, it was it was just such a schmozzle. It was um, it was yeah, it, it really betrayed the the true character of of the yes campaign. I think both campaigns, personally, since we're on the subject of campaigns, uh, did no uh, credit really to what they were arguing for. Well, I mean, if you look at the... the end, it sorry? was definitely the, the uh, no campaign that better, uh, went a bit uh, off the rails. I, th I think it was the, uh, the the turning point was the sort of furor over Macklemore performing at the, the NRL Grand <laughs> Final, which, like, yeah, right. like, it's obviously, like, a political song, but, you know, um, I, I, th I think that some of the reaction <laughs> to fr from the, the no side was a bit over the top. Like what? I yeah. didn't see anything that I thought was over the top, or maybe I just missed it. Oh, it was it, it, it was things like so, like there was that you know petition circling around to, uh, to uh, for the NRL to you know uh, prevent Macklemore from from singing the song, and it had the, a, 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 a you know a picture of like this family like being like you know traumatized by you know hearing the song. Uh, it was, <laughs> 
uh, th- th- things, uh, things like that. And uh, and it was also the fact that the No campaign, I mean, they started to get a bit, you know, uh, triggered themselves. Like, if, if they were being criticised, yeah. like, you know, how dare you, you know, call me, like, a homophobe or a bigot. Like, it was, <laughs> like, they, they were, you know, trying to play the victim themselves. And, like, I, I think the Australian people, they just don't like, you know, people playing the victim, period. It doesn't matter whether it's... You know the people on the yes side or or the, or the no side, and I think I think you know it was it would have been better just to stick to the the issue rather than you know uh, one side or another saying oh I'm being picked on. My God, completely, and that's that that kind of ties in a little bit, Dave, with what you were saying about the vote yes and safe schools, which essentially is they're contradicting their own point, right? I mean, what the fact of the matter is is that in theory, yeah safe schools and gay marriage should have nothing to do with each other. I mean, if you're talking about safe schools and you want to put in a program that has to do with teaching kids how not to be assholes to each other, all for it, you know, why not? Mm. But I think it has to do more with a human issue and with sort of like the the, the predisposition of uh, the people who are on the yes side to um, to virtue signal and to think that they're just the only beacon of... Um, of yeah. wonderfulness in the world yeah, that yeah. made the campaign kind of uh, latch together. So mm. really, yeah, uh, gay marriage and um, and safe schools, the program, which is indoctrinating and awful on its own merits, have nothing to do with each other. But the Boat mm. Yes campaign obviously was advocating for it because I think they're pandering to the same base and they're virtue signaling to the same base. And they're just, you know, and that that's kind of like where the narrative came out about yeah. if you don't vote yes, or if you have your doubts, that is because mm. you are just the most disgusting scum of the earth, That's human right. being. <laughs> you hate everyone. You know, you hate all gays and anyone who isn't uh, exactly yeah. a cis white male, and you're basically equivalent to Hitler. So yeah. that, that's kind of why I'm saying right. both campaigns really didn't do it for me in terms of what they were arguing. Look, Daniel Edmonds in the comments has uh, said... Um, it's utterly absurd to equate er- anything from the no campaign to the utterly disgusting behaviour of the yes campaign. Um, can you think of anything besides some uh, perhaps what what you might call um, snowflakishness, you know, getting upset about Macklemore, um, to the vile behaviour that we yeah, saw I, I mean, on university we, we campuses and streets? And we haven't mentioned yet the fact that Tony Abbott was headbutted by... Uh, well, he didn't claim that he was a yes campaigner. He was uh, uh, wearing a yes a badge that Hobart DJ Astro Loeb, and then there was that um, you know disgusting sign at the uh, uh, No campaign uh, launch, which said, "Was it burn churches, no, not queers?" So yeah, yeah. The, <laughs> the the left have a uh, f- uh, on not just this issue on uh, f- uh, f- all the issues that they campaign on. I mean they. You know, have no hesitation in you know being abusive, uh, uh, or right. even getting violent, and this campaign was no exception. Yeah. So what Daniel is saying um, is, it seems like you were equating um, some, let's concede, less glorious moments of the No campaign mm. with with you know, the average behaviour of the, oh, no, the I, Yes campaign. I, 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 was, I but, was just saying that, you know, like there were flaws on, on both sides of the campaign. And uh, I, I'd, I, I've, like I said at the beginning, it was definitely the, the, yes, the yes campaign that was engaging in, you know, uh, vile behaviour. Um, but, yeah, there was... Right. Uh, I'm saying that there was, as, you know, Donald Trump would say, you know, many, many sides, many sides. But, yeah, yes... <laughs> Uh, I, 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 yeah, I, I, I do right. concede that. Yeah, there was definitely more vileness on the 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 yes side as the the left, uh, and and these were you know leftists, the usual you know leftist socialist uh, uh, people. Yeah, this is really important. I think we talked about this the other day on your podcast, Tim, is that one of the reasons that we see we're, we're both snowflakes on both sides. That's one of the things. I mean, we can all be happy and rejoice at the fact that, um, that uh, no matter what your political orientation, you're probably a, a, a fucking snowflake. However, there is one thing that is so worrisome on the left that the right doesn't have as much, which is the culture of punch a Nazi. First of all, the culture of labeling Nazis, right? Which what is yeah, what yeah. is a Nazi? Anyone who doesn't agree with me. If you're not a Bernie bro, then you're Hitler. Yeah. And then we move on to assume that we have the right. 
Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, no, I, I'm no fan of the guy. However, <laughs> um, the issue is that now we say, oh, if anyone that we label a Nazi is in fact a Nazi, then we can go up and punch him. Yep. Because we're we're, we're it's kind of like we're you know World War Two veterans and we're defending our our uh, our safety. And so that's I think why you see some of the more um, disturbing images of uh, leftists. And I try to separate liberals from leftists because they they are inherently different. Um, kind of going up and inflicting violence on anyone they dislike. It's not yeah. really because it was the Yes campaign organizing people to go out and crack skulls. It's just sure. because we have this incredibly um, worrisome culture on the left that basically, if you don't think the way I do, then that's just because you haven't been woke to the wonderfulness that is my opinion. And I'm basically just going to beat it into your skull until you realize that you're a bigot and come over to our side and vote her for Hillary Rodden Clinton. <laughs> And that's the major concern that yeah. libertarians should have and conservatives do have with this yes campaign and, and the consequence itself is is it's not only the the primary question of of the survey, it's the consequences. It's like we are literally inviting this punch a Nazi culture where we get to create protected classes and anybody who disagrees is inherently flawed in their character and we can now bring the weight of government down upon them to punish them for their unapproved opinions. It's pure totalitarianism at its finest. And, you know, anybody that says the no campaign is on the wrong side of history simply hasn't read enough history. They're, yeah. they're simply ignorant. Like, this marriage experiment is over 100 years old. Lenin mm. introduced the abolition of traditional marriage, and it was such a cataclysmic failure for the Bolshevik Revolution that Stalin, far from the beacon of virtue in, in the mm. uh, 20th century that he was, Stalin saw its failure, and Stalin reinstituted traditional marriage, not because he was a moral beacon, but because it was necessary practically for the functioning of of Soviet society, it was it was a terrible experiment, and you know it is just pure Marxism. This destruction of family, destruction of government, destruction of religion, destruction of nations. It's it's all uh, exactly resulting from this. If you disagree with me then I get to inflict violence upon you. I get to impose freedoms, uh, you know, impose my values upon you. I get to reduce your freedoms. That's I think, well, so, sorry, I, I, I thought that uh, you were there. Okay. But um, yep. one of the things that I think maybe had to do with, uh, with, the, um, with the marriage experiment being such a uh, disaster is that it was imposed without the public opinion behind it. And that's why I think there was just so much backlash. I think if you, if you look at... Um, at these societies nowadays, uh, well, the Western ones, uh, we kind of tend to be pretty apathetic about other people's sex life or love life, and so I think that I think that the that the marriage experiment here of just allowing anyone to marry anyone they want and staying out of their business isn't going to be the the disaster that we saw before because people don't give a shit anymore. Honestly, I think before it just it w it was it was viewed as just such a, a, an abhorrent um, display that anyone who was marrying someone who wasn't a, uh, a woman or a man, you know, their opposite sex was just something so awful. Now, since we just really don't care, I don't think that the same results will be, um, will be shown. So, uh, so yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't really agree with, uh, with, with the fact that, you know, kind of changing the, the definition of marriage at this point will do any, any uh, enormous um, catastrophic changes. Well, again, it's it's not so much a catastrophic change as mm -hmm. as that battle of inches. So, if there's a no result, we mm -hmm. will will find it um, less likely that that um, people like the Tasmanian Archbishop will be hauled before a arbitrary discrimination tribunal for mm -hmm. teaching what the church has taught for two thousand years. If gotcha. we see a yes result. We're mm -hmm. not going to see a cataclysmic change. We're going to see the frog in boiling water get ever so warmer by mm. by those degrees of inches, and it will right. continue. And, you know, right-thinking people, clear-thinking, sober-thinking people have to say enough is enough. Let's draw a line in the sand. No more Marxism. No more growth of the government. No more 
extra rules and regulations and protected classes and reduced freedoms. Let's. Look, I'm very happy with get government out of marriage, but yeah. voting yes to redefining marriage doesn't achieve or work towards that result at all. All it does is lay out the red carpet for the Reds. I, yeah, I agree with you. In fact, I, I wish that instead of being a gay marriage plebiscite, it had been a referendum on the on the government's role in marriage. I think that would have been such a more uh, accurate way to to solve everything. Just basically, uh, do does the public want the government regulating marriage? I think most people would say no. And then everyone go ahead and do whatever you want. I completely agree with you that the government has way too much of a hand in everybody's pocket and in everyone's lives. But yeah, yeah there, there was absolutely. a lot of debate amongst you know libertarians because it is. Uh, f- I, I'm of the opinion that yeah, like marriage privatization, it's uh, a nice idea, but it's it's probably ne- never going to happen. And so we we were you know asked this uh, all or all or nothing question. I mean, do you want the law to uh, have marriages between you know men and women, or do you you know want it to uh, also be between uh, same sex couples? So there was huge debates in libertarian circles. You know how do right. how do I vote? Because you know on on one hand I'm you know uh, allowing people you know for freedom to marry, but on the other way, on the other hand, I'm also uh, expanding uh, government. Right. That's right, and there should have been huge questions and huge delays over it. And uh, look, I'm going to be a little bit harsh if you'll permit me, but I think it was a little bit Pollyanna-ish to vote yes and hope for the best. It was a little bit what? Sorry, I didn't get that. Pollyanna, uh, oh. you know, the world the world is rosy. Pollyanna-ish <laughs> um, is just in- incredibly naive and um, wishful thinking. So I think the wishful thing. thinking is that it's going to have that much of an impact, really. Sorry, Tim, uh, just really quick. I think that the wishful thinking was people, you know, especially the, as you're saying, the Vote Yes campaign, uh, you know, you can't get a cup of coffee in Sydney without someone telling you to vote yes. Uh, but that they think that, you know, it's going to be like this this enormous, you know, wonderful thing. That's that's the rosy thinking, right? It's not, it's, it's even on both sides, this is nothing much to say about nothing in a sense. Like, now we know what the opinion of the public is, but it's not binding. So... What's the big deal? Well, it's certainly a moral authority. And uh, as much as it's not binding, it is still a big deal because because this is the... This is the... Uh, I don't, don't know what to... Call this is the next step. You know, 22, 24, 25 times um, the parliament has said, no, we're not going to mm-hmm. redefine marriage. I mean... No other issue has received no much. Tr- no other trivial issue has received so much attention. I mean, over and over and over again, I heard yes campaigners telling me, um, "Why can't you worry about something more important like global poverty and homeless children?" And I'm like, "Yeah, why can't we? You've been told no. Why don't you let the nation get along with it? Like, just take what the parliament decided in 2004, and you know, two or three times a year since then." Just right. take no for an answer. So this isn't nothing. This is their well. Parliament hasn't worked. This is our workaround. Can we? Right. Can we? You know. And and then they, when they finally had the numbers in Parliament, they thought, well, now we can respect the Parliament's wishes because we've probably got the numbers finally. Right. Um, you know. So yeah, no. It, this is this is a really big deal, and um, clearly both both part major parties. Have indicated they will follow the mandate yeah. of 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 this the survey. So, as much as it's not binding, the major parties have bound themselves to it. Right. And we've got less than uh, ten minutes to go now. Uh, I've it's not clear on the because I've got the the ABS uh, website uh, ready to go. So uh, we'll be able to look at uh, a more deeper analysis of the results when they put there. I'm not sure what comes first, whether it is the uh, the press conference and then they post the um, the the results on the ABS website. I can. I have got the ability to take a radio feed of the the, the press conference, so 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 when that happens, okay. we can listen in and uh, offer our thoughts. Um, uh, fi- final prediction yeah. from everybody. I said at the beginning of the campaign that it will probably be uh, f- uh, fifty three forty seven yes. 
I, th- I think it would I mm-hmm. think it would be a lot tighter than what the polling suggests but I, I I didn't see a way for the the no campaign to overcome such a large uh, deficit uh, in the polls I'm not willing to put a number on it because uh, I want to be positive for Australia and that means my side and um, yeah I'm not willing to predict a loss for my side if if it happens um, it probably won't be a surprise, but um, if if we get up, it certainly will be. Um, however, yeah, uh, we've seen plenty of reasons to doubt polling before, so um, fingers crossed, hands together, by, prayers to heaven. <laughs> uh, by, mer- by narrow margins, though, I think, Tim, Tim, you and I were talking about this the other day, that, uh, yeah, we can, you know, obviously we've had a few black swans uh, of late, but I don't think anything with uh, with polling kind of having such a large gap between the two. Uh, you had some opinions about this, Tim. About polling? Yeah, ab- about the polling relevant to uh, to the plebiscite, because you're saying that it's just basically um, that it's kind of hard to see how vote no could win at this point. It would just be just an, an enormous black swan with what we know uh, uh, this, regarding public opinion. I looked at closely at the, the Irish polling, um, which was, uh, the, that support was always around 70%. The, the end result was uh, 61-39, which account for about an eight-point drop. The, the polling, uh, the more recent polling, has had uh, yes around low 60s. Uh, uh, so, that, so that's where I think that it will be um, uh, that's where I think it'll be low, um, in, in the low fifties, which I don't think it'll be, uh, a uh, convincing or it'll, it'll still be in terms of like, say, you know, like 53, 47 in a like general election that's considered a landslide. Um, okay. yes, uh, but yeah, I, I do think that, you know, um, yes, we'll, probably win by, you know, a, a decent amount of points. Right. Look, uh, what the government, certainly a major coalition party, should do is take seriously the amount of people who've said, you don't share our values. We're, we're very concerned about homosexual marriage. This isn't a fait accompli where an overwhelming majority are happy for you to trash Australia's traditional values. Um, mm. And and uh, if they want the Labor voters to usher them to election, they've probably got another thing coming. And if they want Conservatives to usher them to a victory, they've got to take them a whole lot more seriously. Uh, so, so, uh, uh, we're ca- there's now less than to go. I've got Sky on in the background here where it's like, they're, they've got they've got um, uh, all the like public events in like Sydney, Melbourne, all the other cities, and then mm-hmm. there's uh, there's a um, parliamentary uh, meeting or parliament. I, I think it's the parliamentary like friendship group on LGBT or whatever. They're all waiting for the mm-hmm. results. Um, yeah, this is uh, we're nearly there. And once we do, the goal, then we'll. You know what? Uh, what would happen from here? Because remember that Bill Shorten said, "Well, I'm just going to legalize same-sex marriage uh, anyway." If anyway, it's, if it's a yes, we don't know which um, same-sex marriage bill uh, will get up. Mm. I think that's one of the things, though, right? We're seeing uh, kind of like this lack of um, ability or a willingness to understand the other side or um, the other side's victory. So, and I think this is what uh, Dave. I, I would kind of put to you is that, as you say right now, I think that that uh, that Bill Shorten would say that is um, is ridiculous. You know that he would go against the will of um, the people that he he works for is pretty ridiculous. However, on the other side, if vote yes works, I don't think that people who are uh, pro traditional marriage will stop in their pursuit to keep it that way. Uh, I have a uh, somewhat exceptional um, view of of uh, democracy and representation and I believe uh, representatives should be elected to do the right thing not just to do the popular thing and that sounds easy to agree with I I get that but I 
I think leaders should go against their electorate and live or die by it if they honestly believe the wrong thing is being done. So my lo local member shares my values, but he said he would do whatever the electorate wanted. And most people would agree with that. But I'm like, so if most people want to inject your kids with heroin, you're just going to do it? Like, live or die by your values. If it's the wrong thing and it's bad for society, it's detrimental, it's damaging, it's harmful. If it's unjust, if it's oppressive, you can't do it. Even if it costs you your job, it's the wrong thing to do. So kudos to Bill Shorten for having a spine. I wish somebody on the right would have a spine in the major parties and say, no, forget it. This is the wrong thing to do. Don't care what the survey results say. Marriage is marriage. It's always been between a man and a woman. What other, rede what other redefinitions have happened to it or variations may have existed in mm. other cultures and other jurisdictions. We don't care. We're not going to do this to Australia. We're all for gay rights, but homosexual marriage is not a human right and it's not the right thing to do. And if you don't like it, elect somebody else. Um, right. That's what I think the right thing to do is. Right. And I think that one of the things that has to do with conservatives uh, kind of saying that we're just going to accept whatever the, the, the plebiscite tells us is I think it's more a show of cowardice in politics rather Absolutely. than their inability to, to do the right thing. I think they were uh, already completely willing to pass um, the gay marriage bill. I think they're completely willing to do so. And their only uh, backlash or their only concern was the perception on behalf oh, of their um, here's the Here's the public. press conference. Oh. 34. Let's... Uh, I, I'm not going to be able to get the, the feed up, so... Um, yeah. Oh. I, I don't, I'm not sure if he's going to... I've got the, the ABS website up. It's now 10 a.m. Mm -hmm. Let's see if the website's going to be updated. I called this media conference to announce the results of the Australian Marriage Law Postal Survey. It's probably the only time millions of Australians can you hear that hear from the Australian statistician. Yes. Yep. As the nation's official statistical agency, the ABS provides trusted, relevant, objective statistics to inform Australia's important decisions. ABS statistics provide quality information yeah, about our society, our population, the economy, and the environment. On August 9, 2017, oh. the Treasurer Director of the ABS to ask everyone on the electoral roll if they wish to express a view on the issue of whether the law should be changed to allow same-sex couples to marry. The ABS was required to provide results for the nation as a whole, oh. at the state and territory level, and for every Commonwealth electoral division. It's like the worst reality Is this Rob Oakshot? We have Winston Peters. Today which the ABS has achieved. The ABS worked to enable as many eligible people as possible to participate in the voluntary survey. Together with our government partners and a number of suppliers, our goal was to make the process as easy as possible oh. without compromising the integrity <laughs> of the process or the results. The survey was simple and could be completed by those traveling or living overseas, those in remote communities, people with disability, and those who speak different languages. Only one response per eligible Australian was counted. Mm. Today, along with the results, we also provide a statement on quality and integrity of the survey. Australians can have trust in these statistics. So now to the final count of participation. Ah, oh, Australians reported and responded to this voluntary survey. And the final number was 12,727,920 people. Overall, this survey achieved a response rate of 79.5%. This is outstanding mm. for a voluntary survey. Yes, yes, it is. And well above other voluntary exercises conducted around the world. It shows how important this issue oh. is to many Australians. <laughs> was strong Rob Oakeshott, point O. With all age groups having higher than 70% participation. Participation in the survey was slightly higher at older ages and slightly lower for younger age groups. 
but not markedly so. Interesting. Interesting. Just noting our youngest on the electoral roll, the 18 and 19 year olds responded strongly with around 78% participating. Participation was between 77.9% and 82.4% in every state and territory. Ah, oh, you're really going to do this territory. first. We're 58.4% eligible. <laughs> Ridiculous. <laughs> Participation in the survey was over 70% in 146 of the 150 Commonwealth electorates. Oh. For the remaining four electorates, it was over 60% oh. for three and over 50% for the remaining one. That's interesting. With high and consistent participation rates across ages, states and territories, and Commonwealth electorates, Australians can have confidence <laughs> these statistics reflect the view of the eligible population. And now the official results the, of the Australian... The website has been updated. Don't, don't 61.6%. Yes. Yes responses. Yeah. 7,817,000... And 247. Wow. Representing 61.6% of clear responses. Oh, well, there we go. That's 61.6% yeah, go. of clear responses were yes. No responses. 4,873,000 clear responses. And 987. There we're hearing 7, the cheers of the crowd. Of yeah. Clear responses. That's 38.4% of clear responses were no. A further 36,686 responses were unclear. Let me know when you want me to cut this and we can begin the discussion. I think, I think that would be, I think we've heard probably what, uh, what we yeah. need to hear. Okay. So there you go. The, the polling was correct. So basically 60, yeah. 61, 39, which is, that's pretty emphatic, emphatic victory for the, the yes, yes. vote. It is, yeah. Um, can I ask you how how uh, how you're feeling about the the result, Dave? I, I feel sad for Australia. Um, it's no surprise because the polling did predict it. Um, I guess the surprise is the polling was right. Um, but uh, yeah, look, it's it is a sad day for my nation that we've. Um, taken one more step to rejecting the the christian heritage um that has made not only our nation great but every western democracy uh since the magna carta and you know what this doesn't really change much at all um you know in our day-to-day -day lives uh, right. it changes everything and it changes nothing um it's you know we're still yet to see any details around what this law will look like and it's you know could be really really bad from here if uh the lefties get their way and there are no protections for religious freedom freedom of political expression freedom of mm. speech um, or it could be less bad where the consequences are only on our children um that doesn't seem like it's a you know, th there's a lesser of, of two evils, of course, but neither outcome is is good for the nation. And, you know, there is no way on God's green earth that the yes side would have ever taken no for an answer. And I think, like all good citizens, we should continue to fight for good legislation, and this isn't the end of anything, and um, it shouldn't be. Okay, we've got the interactive map up of state by state, so let's go to that. Mm -hmm. Uh, currently okay. our viewers can see that. So the highest was the ACT, no surprises there, 74%. Uh, right. Next was uh, Vic Victoria, 64.9%. Then it was WA next, 63.9%. Then we had Tasmania, 63.6%. South Australia, 62.5%. Right. Uh, Queensland, 60.7%. Uh, Northern Territory, 60.6%. And the lowest was New South Wales, 57.8%. Wow. And I think that I know why that might be. Does anyone else want to take a guess why it was so low in New South Wales? Uh, no, I, I have no idea. What do you think? Well, I think because it no, has the highest uh, ethnic uh, population who were firmly in the no camp. Uh, there's large um, Chinese and Asian community there and obviously large oh, um, interesting. Muslim community there. 
So that's why I suspect it was so low in New South Wales. That's a good thought. Um, certainly, yeah, yeah. Um, interesting. Only state yeah, certainly below 60%. We don't... Wow. Um, yeah, no, no, no. That, that's actually surprising. I think, I think uh, at least at least with people's perception of NSW, that's that's probably what they would not have expected. But yeah, that, that's a that's a good point, uh, Tim. And uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll see if I can bring up my electorate division. I'm not sure how to view this map. I think if you zoom in, okay, it'll will it work? So our viewers seeing this, <laughs> yes, they are. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Now, now's the fun part. Now, where we can, well, uh, it's probably right. not fun for you, Dave, but then we, when we can have a look at yeah. uh, detailed analysis, the result, uh, and uh, it's so... all fun. It's all fun. It's all great yeah. for political nerds like us. <laughs> so yeah. if I go, let's have a look by New South Wales. It has. Uh, it has the result by electric here. So if we have a look, um, yeah, the the ones in Western Western Sydney. So um, Banks, which is in Western Sydney, that that was um, they they voted no. Barton's also in Western Sydney. They voted no. Uh, Chifley, Ed Husick's electorate, they voted no. Um, wow. Well, Blacksland, which is Andrew Clare's seat, they voted overwhelmingly no, 73.9%. Wow. Let's have a look. Uh, Hughes, which is Craig Kelly's seat, uh, they voted yes. So, so it's almost okay. like upside down at the moment. All of the Labour electorates are voting uh, no. And let's have a look. Um... Yeah, uh, Greenway, which is in Western Sydney, they voted no. Um, North Sydney, well, that's not a surprise, they voted yes. Parramatta voted no, um, which is another Labour seat. Sydney, no surprise. Warringah, wow. uh, 75% yes. Wow. Watson, which I believe is Tony Burke's seat, they voted overwhelmingly no, almost 70%. And Werriwa, well, um, Chris Hayes, he was already no, they voted no. Wentworth, uh, Malcolm Turnbull's seat, 80% yes. Right. So, where else do I want to look? Uh, New England voted yes, uh, just narrowly, 52.5%. McMahon, which is Chris Bowen's seat, they voted mm. uh, overwhelmingly no, almost 65%. Yeah, so it doesn't surprise me that uh, Western Sydney was where the... Oh, have a look at Cook, which is um, uh, uh, Scott Morrison's seat. Yeah, they voted yes, 55, 45. Okay. Um, right. So we'll we'll turn back to the discussion now. If you don't if you don't mind me, I'm right. just going to um, yeah. continue to look at the results. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, one of the things that I think that has to be said, even as um, as a person who is uh, pro gay marriage, and I think that uh, that the result isn't a bad thing, is that Dave, you are you are uh, well based in your concern that basically this is going to be used as sort of the um, the base that a lot of um, leftists stand on to pass mm. some of their more worrying legislate, uh, legislative agenda. So I kind of understand what you mean by really not not thinking that the that the gay marriage part of it is the biggest deal of all, even though though you do oppose it. But, but what what could come afterwards? And I mm. think that this is the time when uh, the conservative movement has to be far more proactive and far more honest with their agenda and with what they want to achieve and in energizing their base to be able to counteract some of the more worrying things that the leftists, not the left, the leftists want to yeah. do. So wanting sure. to impose um, safe schools, for example, which I think is a among one of the most uh, worrisome things that have, that, uh, have been proposed for education ever, um, we can't let them say the culture has changed, we voted yes, this is what's going to happen. Yep. And it's it's the conservatives' um, responsibility at this point to yes. start to speak like actual traditional, cool, you know, traditional, well-based conservatives and mm. not um, not act like the no campaign was acting. 
and not base themselves on anecdotal evidence and um, and fear mongering on things that people could kind of verifiably know is false and turn to um, to the real facts and turn to what is actually going to be better for Australia. So what I do, do you agree think with was you. verifiably false that the no campaign asserted. Well, for example, that uh, in in countries where uh, where gay marriage passes, uh, programs like safe schools become widespread and compulsory. That's absolutely not true. Uh, I come from two countries that have that, and the only place where uh, where uh, these types of programs have come have become widespread and compulsory are California, and I think um, some other state in the U.S. And the rest of them have not implemented uh, at a wide at a wide scale all these worrisome. Um, leftist propaganda in Mexico. Obviously, Mexico is far more, more traditional, but Mexico also has gay marriage. We don't see that there either. Um, so I think that... I, that kind I don't of, think... Like, um, yeah. I, I'm going to push back on you on that. Canada Thank and you. England, um, you know, are huge concerns. And, and it doesn't need to be um, widespread and compulsory to be highly probable. You know, if Canada and England can go so far down the track that they have had within their countries making it widespread and compulsory, then it's not a stretch of the imagination, let alone verifiably false, that it's a real concern um, in Australia, especially when they didn't even wait for the redefinition of marriage. They went ahead and preemptively presumed culture was going to be okay with this. And you can see the intense bullying of people who disagree with it already, yeah, that they're already becoming prosecuted, uh, persecuted for it. And I was like, well, actually, no, a boy is a boy and a girl is a girl. And telling a five-year-old, eight-year-old or a 15-year-old that there's anything different is abusive. It's ignorant. It's anti-scientific. And it's plain wrong on every level, both intellectual and, and moral. So I've got to push back on you on that one. I don't think that was... Uh, a bad claim by by the no campaign, but you know, feel free to. I, it's, it's, yeah, I don't really see the. Um, sorry, yeah, sorry it's, it's going to be harder to because uh, I definitely you know oppose safe schools. It's not right of you know uh, you know yeah. the education system to push you know any you know worldview or lifestyle. It's definitely going Agreed. to be harder for. Uh, you know, safe schools now to be opposed, given that it is has been an overwhelming uh, yes vote, um, and, and, yeah. th and that's where it, that's where I think I, I believe the no side did make a mistake by making it because that that was mainly all about uh, most of their their advertising was about you know uh, safe schools and. And right. definitely, it's not just that, but also, you know, trying to, you know, bring in other issues as well. I mean, like Tony Abbott, you know, saying that if you don't like political correctness, vote no. I mean, does this result now mean that, you know, the Australian people approve of uh, political correctness? And there was also another time, right. he didn't, ma he made this on a, uh, I think a radio segment, Tony Abbott, but he didn't do it in a public statement, you know, linked the push for same-sex marriage with the, you know, anti-Australia Day uh, you know, movement. Like, does yeah. that mean that the Australian people voted against, you know, a, a Australia Day? So I think <clears> that, uh, you know, bringing in these outside issues, it's it, it allows an opportunity for the cultural left to, you know, hold up these service rights and say, look, right. the Australian people, uh, you know, v voted this way. That means, you know, they voted for all these other things. You know, you said, like, people are going to play, you know, for example, right. Lars Shelton's, um, you know, uh, interviews over and over again saying, you know, a yes vote is right. a vote for, you know, gender fluidity and safe schools. <laughs> Exactly, which obviously uh, has no base in reality. And uh, yeah, that's what I was saying a little bit before. Uh, we can't let this be the stepping stone that the uh, you know insane SJW uh, leftists use to uh, propagate their agenda. Um, but on Emilio, the other hand, it it sorry. doesn't it doesn't not have no basis in in reality. It, I mean, we we just what talked about this um, that a yes vote is a vote for safe schools. Would like. I, I just demonstrated Canada and England. That's that is the foreseeable and probable, right. not not widespread and compulsory, you know, given, but it's certainly right. a demonstrably probable outcome of this. And and yeah. the necessary um, yeah. campaign message is that is that this is a probable conclusion. If you do vote right. for homosexual marriage, this is a probable outcome. Um, no, it it doesn't mean that you 
fully comprehend the danger of safe schools and their and knowingly endorse it. I don't think that's the assertion. Right. The assertion was, and it would be disingenuous of any yes campaigner, which wouldn't be their first time of being disingenuous. But it wouldn't be their. It would be disingenuous of them to assert that oh, sixty percent of people want safe schools. Right. That's that's crazy. But I, you know. Um, uh, yeah, you, you rubbished what, the way Lyle particularly um, phrased or articulated that concern, and mm. I just don't think that's fair. I think I think you misunderstood me. What I'm saying is, when I said that it has no Good. basis in reality, is yeah, is that um, is that basically a vote for gay marriage is the 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 Australian people giving their consent to every other leftist um, point of view that uh, that even though the leftists are going to say this means that this is what the people want. Okay. Yeah. That that's what has no basis in reality. Because I'm so we can with you flip that their is... argument back on them and saying, hang on, it was a one dimension. You said it was one dimensional. You said there were no other concerns and you said that it wouldn't result. Exactly. I, I apologize, I misunderstood you. No, 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 no worries. Uh, and no, what you said was important <coughs> to say, so I'm glad you misunderstood me. But, um, but yeah, essentially this is the time when we have to see, okay, so listen, sometimes uh, things don't happen ideally the way everyone wants it to, but what we can have is changes Malcolm in society Sandals that don't have far-reaching implications. Yeah, Sandals. let's go ahead. No, I'll, no, I'll, no, I'll not that late. Yeah. Yes now I know that many people, a minority obviously, voted no. But we are a fair nation. There is nothing more Australian than a fair go. There is nothing more Australian than equality and mutual respect. And everyone has had their say. That's what we pledged at the last election. Many people stood in our way. The Labor Party, number of people on the crossbench and others. They didn't want Australians to have their say. We did. And it is a great credit to Matthias Cormann that he was able to put together this ABS postal survey, a great credit to him, a great credit to the ABS and the officers of the Australian Electoral Commission that assisted them to have this done so efficiently, so comprehensively, so emphatically. And I say to all Australians, whatever your views on this issue may be, we must respect the voice of the people. We ask them for their opinion and they have given it to us. It is unequivocal. It is overwhelming. They are our masters. We who are elected to Parliament, it is our job now to get on with it. Get on with it and get this done. It's fair. The people have voted yes for marriage equality. Now it's our job to deliver it. Matthias. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prime Minister. We went to the last election promising uh, to give the Australian people the opportunity to have their say as to whether or not the law should be changed to allow same-sex uh, couples to marry. Uh, we've delivered on that commitment. Uh, the Australian people uh, have spoken and resolved uh, that the law should be changed uh, to allow same-sex uh, couples to marry, and uh, it is now incumbent on the Australian Parliament uh, to um, act uh, on that decision, to implement that decision. Uh, as the government... Okay, there we go. So obviously the, I mean, the pressure is now on the, yeah. the politicians to uh, legislate uh, you know, sa same-sex marriage and this has already been uh, the debate for the, the past, few, uh, past few days about we have two uh, competing bills. We have the, the Dean Smith bill which is a pretty you know, simple amendment to the Marriage Act which just changes uh, you know, it from being between a man and a woman to uh, two people and provides protections for uh, religious ministers and celebrants. Then there's the uh, James uh, James Patterson conservative uh, backed bill, which um, you know has a whole lot of uh, protections, uh, such as for right. conscientious objectors, has a safe schools clause in it. It actually doesn't change the definition of marriage; just adds a new type of of marriage in. And now everyone's mm. really turning to the attention to what the parliament does. I mean, does it make sense pragmatically to think of putting uh, together, to enacting into law a completely different uh, definition of marriage? I don't think so. I think that what's probably going to happen is that it's just um, it's just going to be amended. 
the man and a woman part is going to be changed to two people. And I think that that's probably uh, how it's going to go forward. I don't know what you think, Dave. Uh, I, I don't think there's enough of a conservative libertarian uh, will in the parliament. There, there are some strong people in there, certainly, um, Corey Bernardi. But, um, yeah, certainly neither the government nor the opposition has the collective will to actually protect freedom or speech or political expression. And so they will make this as simple as possible and leave the power increasingly so in the hands of the anti-discrimination tribunals in each state, um, which have been right. weaponized and seized by the left. Right. Now, you're both uh, more on the right than I am. I'm more of a centrist. But uh, I, what I have heard, and maybe you can clear this up for me a little bit more, is the whole um, controversy with the wedding cakes and the floor designers, basically people saying that it goes against their uh, religious liberty or their uh, religious uh, ideals to cater or to work for a uh, same-sex wedding. And that's their opinion. Now, to me, I don't know, and you can you can clear this up for me, is I just never, never understood uh, how that was such an enormous issue. I always kind of assumed that um, generally the anti-discrimination uh, clauses would not allow them to do so. But at the same time, I don't know what uh, how many businesses are even willing at this point to say no to a... Um, a same-sex wedding, uh, knowing the, the, the backlash that they will receive. So my question is to you, do you think that really legislatively changing this will do any more difference since really a large part of the backlash that people receive, the businesses receive not wanting to cater um, same-sex weddings, is more societal? My, uh, my understanding of this situation has to do with people want laws to achieve different things. Uh, mm -hmm. Conservatives, <coughs> libertarians, those on the right typically right. want the law to be right. Those on the left typically want the law to achieve their desired outcomes. Um, so, you know, does the... I don't think the law has to achieve my desired outcomes. I think mm -hmm. the law has to be right. And okay. so if, if the law permits for somebody to be wrong, then that is something you know, something uh, morally wrong, then I think that's okay. That's that's okay and that's necessary because you you um, uh, uh, um, alluded to the backlash that might happen mm. if somebody was, you know, discriminating against a homosexual wedding. Mm -hmm. um, that's okay. I have no problem with the culture deciding which way, um, you know, shaping the average behavior there's always right. going to be idiots there's always going to be stupid people there's always going to be haters there's always going to be people who are extreme unbalanced and wrong mm -hmm. and i don't think somebody refusing a gay wedding is that by the way i'm just saying i you know theoretically yeah. law shouldn't be compelling us to be moral people what it should be doing mm -hmm. is protecting citizens from personal injury and, and protecting our, our rights to private property because those two things prevent the overreach of government, prevent dictatorships, prevent totalitarian states. Now, there's a lot of conflation that discriminating against a wedding is discriminating against homosexual people. It's not. Right. The test cases that we've seen around the world usually involve homosexual clients who have been long-standing welcome clients of a particular business and the gotcha. line has only been drawn when it requires the business to facilitate the celebration of something that they personally feel is immoral and goes against their convictions. It's not a personal gotcha. condemnation. It's not a devaluation of the individuals. It's mm. not a slight. It's not an insult. And if somebody you know, wants to make laws to protect feelings, we've already <laughs> gone far too far down that track. Absolutely. But, yeah. but the reality is, is that people should have the right to refuse service to anybody for any good or terrible reason because compelling somebody to provide a service is just slavery it's a, it's a trespass of an incursion of freedom that is is far beyond the the right role of government in society and mm -hmm. so yeah a business should be able to do 
the right or wrong thing by anybody's opinion and right. face the consequences. So that I don't fly Qantas anymore because I resent their role in this debate. Wherever possible, I'll fly anybody else. That's the free market. They have every right to say stupid things that I disagree <laughs> with, and I have every right to choose somebody else to, to fly, to fly with. with. And if I'm in a minority, they're safe. And if I'm in a majority, they need to change or live by the right. consequences. And I think that should be the freedom that every business has, that they can just say, look, it's nothing about you. And the law that um, the law that Patterson's proposed hasn't mm -hmm. said it's okay to discriminate against homosexuals. They've said, he said, only in the case of facilitating the celebration of something that goes against your convictions. You can't say, no, I'm not going to bake a cake for right. your birthday. You do yeah, have yeah. to bake a cake for their birthday. Um, so, I, I, you know, this is... This really is the test, and we've seen exactly how false the claims were of the left that there would be no imposition on religious freedom. Religious freedom mm -hmm. isn't freedom if it's restricted to the four walls of a church and one day of a week and a right. and professional religious person. That's, that's not freedom. That's, that's a, you know, how big of you? Thanks. Toleration. Yeah, yeah. Like to, condescending. Um, yeah, touch on... Yeah, this uh, uh, this anti discrimination issue. Now, I've I've spoken to a lot of people on the yes side, and I was like, surely you know uh, mm -hmm. it's wrong to you know compel you know a you know a Christian baker who's opposed to same sex marriage to bake the cake. Their response is always, you know, why should uh, uh, you know gay people be you know singled out for uh, you know discrimination when it doesn't apply to uh, anyone else? They've always said, you know, why can't you know I you know discriminate against you know somebody who's uh, you know, homophobic, for example, which I understand is a loaded term, but you know that that's just the point of view that they've put forward. And you know, I, I exactly. do understand that you know anti discrimination law. It's a separate you know discussion, and I'd certainly like Australia to have that discussion about whether we need you know anti discrimination laws uh, in in the first mm -hmm. place. Because yes, the the power of the the market is you know quite quite powerful. And if a business, for example, if there were no anti discrimination laws in a business, put aside up, you know, the the old one used to be no Jews, no blacks. They they wouldn't be in business for very long. Yeah. I vaguely remember a story it was a few years ago. Um, you know, some business put up a sign saying, you know, we don't want you know Africans to apply for you know a a, a, a job here. And not surprisingly, that business was shut down in the next like few days because the backlash was yeah, uh, uh, so severe. The thing with the the right. Patterson bill, which uh, there's been a lot of discussion about it, is that it seems to it seems to instead of like the obviously the you know LGBT people want to um, you know protect you know gay people from discrimination, there is a lot of people who believe that the Patterson Bill seem, uh, wants to protect um, uh, traditional marriage people from the like the free market consequences of their actions. So it's been put to me that uh, say right. uh, like I put, I put this example in like you know obviously the big banks they they all support same sex marriage. But, you know, what if, like, yeah. one of their bank managers said, well, I'm not going to open up a, like, joint bank account for a, um, a, a same-sex married uh, couple? It's been put to me that, um, you know, the, the bank wouldn't be able to take recourse against the, uh, the bank manager because he would be protected as a conscientious objector, even though they all have gotcha. a, uh, L, you know, LGBT inclusion policy, which seems to be, that seems to be the government, you know, protecting... Uh, protecting, you know, s somebody with a, you know, s uh, traditional marriage view more than what the market would allow. Yeah, absolutely, and that that's kind of one of the things that I want to touch on uh, because uh, when you when you um, Dave said this um, that there's this approach where you basically can't discriminate against gay people just because maybe uh, you don't like them. Maybe the only objection, uh, the only, sorry, the only exception would be, you know, uh, forwarding um, a ceremony that you don't agree with. Uh, that would be uh, a little bit more of a pragmatic approach, I think, because obviously I'm very worried about giving uh, businesses permission to discriminate. And maybe mm. in a big city like Sydney, we wouldn't see, you know, we, we can't see how that would be... Um, not much of an issue because we're fairly open-minded and if you know one one business did that we could just go on to the next and that business would probably go bankrupt uh, on the other hand though I think about smaller towns smaller places places where maybe um, people who are gay people who are ethnic minorities things like that are really very very uh, the very small part of the um, 
of the pie, and they might actually see far more uh, consequences from that. So I do agree with with your point of view on that. However, right now Tim was making a really interesting point about uh, the bank manager, and I'm I'm wondering when it talks about a ceremony. Uh, how we would have to be super, super rigid in how we define ceremony. Because then again, if a bank manager says, basically, I consider uh, this, uh, you know, opening a, a joint bank account a ceremonious occasion, it's basically them starting their financial life together and starting to be a unit as a married couple. So I'm not going to open it for them. So I think if, we, if we're vague with the, with the um, uh, language, then that's when we could get into some really dicey territory. I don't think uh, concerns about that would be uh, reasonable. Uh, you know, clearly you don't need a bank account to be present at your at your wedding. Um, you know, I think a, a common sense uh, approach to this. Um, you know, if the bank the bank isn't the bank manager is invited to the wedding, the bank <laughs> account the bank account isn't there. Um, right. you know, nobody's These asking the bank the to participate that people in a, have, like putting in a to wedding. Me, like how how long does yeah, the a... uh, uh, does the objection of uh, last for? Like, does it is it only for the wedding itself, or does it apply to you know uh, same sex couples when they are married? Right. Correct. And and if they read the the if they read the legislation or listened to Patterson's explanation of it, there's mm -hmm. absolutely no suggestion or hint that it's okay to discriminate against homosexual people. Mm -hmm. It's the event, and it starts and stops with the event. Um, you, you know, in, look, it's, it's the celebration of, of the, you know, the idea that is the, that is the problem. So anything that supports that idea and promotes that idea, you know, is is something that people should be free to abstain from and say, look, no thanks, I've got no problem with you, but I don't want to have a part in what you're doing. Um, yeah. And I, I think it should be fairly common sense and fairly straightforward from there. What, Why this becomes murky and why this becomes complicated is because we've started to value feelings above facts and freedom. And I was like, hang on, let's just... You don't need to approve of my religion before I have freedom of religion. That's not right. freedom of religion. That's approved ideas. And exactly. what if I've got unapproved ideas? You know, now I've got imposed ideas. Like, it's just ridiculous. So freedom to disagree is, is what we need. Um, and, hey, I disagree with the Ku Klux Klan ceremony. I'm of not going to make a cake for that. Now, I identify as Ku If someone claimed to identify as a white supremacist, then people should be able to say, look, I disagree with that. It goes against my conviction without facing anti-discrimination because we've gone against somebody's feelings or identity. Right. It's just ludic, you know, providing, applying the same logic in other scenarios is, is just ridiculous. And um, Tim Wilson was arguing with Lyle Shelton and, and saying, you know, so where, where should the line be stopped? And it's like, it shouldn't be stopped. You, you don't get to approve of what ideas enjoy freedom. Bad ideas get to enjoy mm. freedom. And who says what's good or bad ideas? Heaven help us if it's ever the government. That's right. what free debate should be about. To claim it's a simple issue absolutely is uh, ridiculous. One of the things that just came to my mind, for example, is how, um, first of all, it, it is kind of bizarre, as you say, that uh, that we could like sue a company for not uh, for not taking our money. It seems like you know it's it's money. I'll I'll take it. Uh, so that that yeah. seems like it's curious that we would that we would start having this debate. But that's where we're at now. Um, but here's another thing that I was thinking. Let's say at some point you're a wedding planner. You have no problem with gay weddings or anything. Uh, then it turns out that the people are just actually really nasty and really rude, and you just feel like you don't want to work with them because it, you just don't want to because they are just difficult clients. And so you say no. Yeah. Um, is this law going to come in and protect them and basically just, I mean, I should rephrase this. Is this law going to be basically a stick with which anybody who is considered a minority can take it and basically hit any, any business over the head when they've been mm. treated not exactly the way that they wanted to be treated, which I think is worrisome. With and I, I think the answer is a very easy yes, of course it is. We've seen that everywhere. We've seen... Um, 
you know, we've seen bakers being, you know, sued because they wouldn't make a cake and write on top of it, um, I love gay marriage or I support same-sex mm. marriage. You know, like they were literally set up, entrapped, and and um, it, it was all because they were weaponizing anti-discrimination law. Um, yeah. It's, it, right. yeah, that's definitely going to happen because there are people, you know, on the left who are clearly motivated by what, the, what they see as a sense of revenge that, you know, the, you know, Christians yeah. and, you know, uh, conservatives have been, you know, pressing them for, you know, f 50 plus years and now it's, you know, their time to, you know, punish them and, you know, take it a bit back. I mean, the, the, the left have a lot of, you know, vitriol in them, not just on this issue, mm. but, you know, others. That's why they, you know, are, are not just like, for example, there was... Uh, uh, but a month ago in you know Manchester, they unfurled the "Hang the Tories" banner. I mean, they they hate their political mm. opponents, and you know if they they could, they would uh, you know kill them. Um, so so yeah, there 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 definitely is going to be following so this. True. You know, um, you know pe people on the left who are going to want to you know like make make an example of. Uh, you know, conservative Christians and say, ha ha, now we've got the power. Now it's, you know, your turn to, you know, suffer, which is, you know, a really poor attitude to have in society. Absolutely. So how do we defend against that? That's my point. And that's that's what I was alluding to a little bit earlier is essentially, yes, this vote yes campaign, uh, which, again, I think is good uh, when it comes to gay marriage. I, I'm not ignorant to the fact there are people who have political motivations to turn this into uh, a stick to beat other people. So my question is, for conservatives going forward, what is the approach? Clearly, the approach of the vote no campaign didn't work. Clearly, um, appealing to people's uh, uh, feelings and to the tradition of this subject has did not work for the vote no campaign in, in a big uh, sense. So how are we? How are are you really? Because you, you're the people that are more conservative. How are you going to make sure that in this world that may be shifting in terms of opinions towards uh, towards a more leftist um, point of view, how are you going to make sure that we have uh, protections under whichever laws or whichever regulations want to be imposed by these politically motivated leftists? I think it's hard to say the world is shifting left. Um, I, I think the world is polarizing. Uh, I think the left is shifting further left, uh, and the the right um, needs to um, really stand the ground. And uh, you know, I think it's too much to say that um, the approach didn't work. Uh, I think the approach didn't have enough time to work. Is is okay. at least a possibility, if Actually. if not if not what happened. Um, you mm. know, again, I said at, at the early on in in this um, broadcast that that this was rushed. There wasn't a fair time to campaign and educate Australia on on the concerns articulately, and it did have to end up being a somewhat emotional um, campaign, saying, "Look at all these anecdotes of what's happened around, you know, the the three ladies with their concerns about safe schools in that advertisement right. in the first week of the campaign yeah. was tremendously effective." You know, the oh, really? Yes campaign lost a million voters, according to, you know, internal polling, a million voters in that week from, from that ad. Um, people are really concerned about this stuff. So I, I think the solution to answer the second part of your, your question, you know, what are you going to do? Um, I think we're doing it. The three of us are doing mm. it. And, and that is, I think the solution to better government and better laws is better voters. I think yeah. we need people to be better informed. And yes. we need people to be better involved and not leave it to the hysterical activists who are obsessed with penalty rates and trees. Um, we need to leave it to, we need to get the people who are actually worried about their families, um, right. about family values, uh, about um, gender theory and Marxism, mm. and actually say, look, hey guys, there's this, there's this thing that's been going on for ages and it's been absolutely pervasive in mainstream culture. Mm. Uh, mainstream media, Hollywood. Um, we see the the gutter filth of the Hollywood culture manifesting now. They yeah. these are the people that have been lecturing us on morality and telling us what's right and wrong. And it turns out they're the lowest form of human behaviour on the planet. They are the rape culture that really exists. There's not one on universities, but there absolutely is one on Hollywood, Hollywood sets. 
um, and you know the casting couch. This is where That's we're awful. getting our yeah. morality from, and yep. it's the wrong place. We need to be better informed, and we need to be encouraging these discussions that say respectfully, let's disagree and find right. out the truth between us. Let's, Absolutely. Let's let's not make it about left or right winning. Let's make it about Australia winning. Let's make it about right. truth winning, because truth is real. It's not a possession. There's no such thing as my truth. Um, it, it's objective and it's fixed. And if we're intellectually honest and just have a little bit of respect for each other, we can find it together and everybody can win because, you know, that is a win. Living in ignorance is not a win. Absolutely. And do you think that maybe also um, for both of you, uh, sorry, Tim, I'll just, just a really quick point because that's really important, that this type of debate here between three people who can find common ground but have pretty uh, – large disagreements, um, but debate respectfully, this is not the type of, of thing that people want to see right now. I think people are shifting much more towards a, a CNN-style debate where basically the numbers are in people screaming at each other, trying to shut each other down, trying to make each other look like idiots. You see this mm -hmm. anytime you, you, you flip through through Facebook. It's like, you know, this person gets wrecked, this person gets destroyed, this person gets shut down. Mm -hmm. I mean, how much, I mean, isn't isn't that one of the biggest issues that right now, it's not in people's interest to see people agree with each other, find common ground, and then disagree civilly. It's all about seeing each other yell. At, it's all about seeing us yell at each other and shut each other down. Oh, yeah, you saw that in the, the, the campaign. I mean, there, there was, uh, I lost count of how many videos there were of, like, no campaigners, you know, getting uh, abused on the uh, on the street. Yeah, uh, f uh, de yeah. definitely, um, you know, political uh, discourse is getting... Getting getting more heated, and there's uh, there, there's definitely a sense that you know we're you know losing our you know our our our, our sense of you know humanity, like when dealing with other people, that you know we're speaking yeah. with you know another another human being. It's it's you know we're it's it's becoming exactly. more uh, a adversarial. Yeah. Yeah. Look, uh, democracy is adversarial. It's it's the worst thing and it's the best thing uh, about it. Um, when it's personally adversarial, that's where we have a problem. It needs right. to be ideologically adversarial. We've got the government and the opposition, and you know, no matter which major parties in the opposition, they seem to take their job description very seriously. They'll just oppose everything. Exactly. Our our, our legal system is adversarial, um, and you know debates are adversarial but i think i think promoting and fostering the attitude i described before of we don't want left or right you or me red or blue to win we want truth to win and if we can make you know encourage a culture where Australia wins and it's not about feelings but it's about facts um that's look that's a hard road it's a it's a hard u-turn to make in the direction culture has been going um because it has become i guess to modify what you said tim adversarial it's become personally adversarial um and the problem with disagreeing with homosexuality is is the homosexual lobby believes mm -hmm. it's a violation of their personal integrity no no it's it's not right. a disagreement with your existence gotcha. or your identity it's a dis disagreement with your idea. And if that's not up for debate, we're, we're lost as a society. If we can't debate ideas, what hope is there? We might as well go and live in the Bolshevik Revolution where people just got executed left, right and centre for unapproved opinions. Um, we, we have to have that freedom. Otherwise, the imposition of ideas by government is, is a horrible um, society to live in it's 1984 new speak old speak dangerous it's just yeah, it's absolutely dangerous it's very dangerous i'll, I'll talk yeah. about some of the reaction to it so i'm just looking at twitter at the moment so yeah people are sinking mm -hmm. the boot into you know tony abbott can and only eric, imagine er, eric Abbas. Yeah. um there's also uh, not surprisingly rob oakshot is trending given that long-winded uh prelude uh to, to the results right <laughs> so uh, so de so definitely um yeah there there's already a lot of yes yes people who are you know f e eager to to stick the boot in um do we want to look at some more detailed results because i think they are interesting 
Sure. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. Yep, so just bring up uh, the ABS website again. So this is, uh, well, we've already looked at um, New South Wales. We'll look at Victoria now. So Aston, which is that Ellen Tudge's seat, overwhelmingly yes. Uh, Bal- uh, Ballarat. It's it's interesting that uh, I'm noticing that regional Australia voted overwhelmingly yes, not rural uh, uh, Australia, which uh, regional is, you know, those, um, you know, not in the capital city, but still like a major... Um, uh, major population base. Uh, Batman, which is in, in uh, Melbourne, not surprisingly, voted yes. Bendigo, yep, they voted overwhelmingly yes. Uh, Bruce, which is in... Right. Uh, that, that's in southeast Melbourne, which, um, again, has a uh-huh. large uh, migrant population. They voted uh, no. A- and I believe that okay. the MP for Bruce, um, Julian Hill is his name. I believe that he's Labour. I-, I believe that he's actually gay himself, so... They elected a um, oh. gay MP, but don't want him to get married. <laughs> uh, Corwell, that's in <laughs> that's uh, outer, um, out, outer western Melbourne. They voted no. Again, a Labour seat. Mm. Uh, Casey, the Speaker Tony Smith's seat, uh, they uh, voted overwhelmingly yes. Chisholm, that's uh, in, in a Melbourne marginal seat, which is Julia Banks, uh, voted yes. Kerangumite, which is... That's out of Geelong and uh, uh, the Surf Coast. Voted overwhelmingly yes. Karaya, which is Geelong. Right. That's uh, overwhelmingly yes. Uh, Deakin, uh, that's Michael Suka's seat. They voted overwhelmingly yes, 65%. Uh, right. Dunkley which, and uh, Flinders, which is near where I live. They're both reasonably safe liberal seats. Voted overwhelmingly right. uh, yes. Shelly Brand, Tim Watts, uh, that's in Melbourne, 68th. Gippsland, Goldstein, Tim Wilson seat, overwhelmingly yes. Gordon, which is right. um, mm. uh, Western Melbourne, they marginally voted voted yes. Higgins, which is in a Melbourne, right. not surprisingly. Holt, which is that takes in Dandenong again, large migrant population. Tim is Gorton. Tim is Gorton in Western Melbourne. How um, metropolitan is that? Is that a regional centre or is that fairly inner city? A, or you know, outer suburbs. Outer suburbs. Ah. That's a fairly fairly low result for uh, for being somewhat metropolitan. Uh, again, a large, 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 large migrant population. Uh, it takes okay. in Melton, where the Muslim suburb is being proposed. So that uh, that should gotcha. probably clear that clear that up for you. Um, <laughs> Yeah, Hotham is in inner Melbourne. Uh, there are a lot of Muslims in favour of redefining marriage. Yeah, that, that's why um, it's, it's uh, a, a lot of other people have pointed out that you know it's the the areas with uh, um, yeah high migrant populations that have uh, produced the biggest no vote, and the uh, it's it's clear to me that the white areas the you know the like i mentioned before the regional areas that uh, have produced right. some of the biggest uh yes votes mm. interesting yeah, no. it's uh, it provides a bit of a paradox for those lefties who believe in the relativism of uh, multiculturalism well, uh are all these multicultural ethnicities wrong in their cultural value uh, of I, heterosexual marriage, I, I made a joke where that when I appeared on the the Kangaroo um, uh, channel that uh, f- it, it, it looked like the like the Bogan majority was going to win this vote, which seems to be proven correct. It's you know the the white um, you know uh, out of, out of suburban uh, you know people in um, regional Australia who appear to have won this vote, and it's. You know the the immigrants that you know the left uh, left right. so much who who've all, all voted no. Hails so, to you know for for all this yeah. you know demonization of you know white uh, you know straight uh, people they're the ones who've yeah. you know, voted in favour of same sex marriage. Yeah, it really speaks a lot about the um, cannibalism of our culture and society. Yeah. That um, that yeah, we're we're just Im- imploding with this you know fantasy of you know right. white privilege and and all this other nonsense right. where whereby you know the rest of the world is going what are you smoking 
<laughs> Only 17 <laughs> electorates That's so true. Voted, and, uh, uh, voted no, and 12 of those were in uh, uh, Western Sydney. So in terms of electorate by electorate, it was a pretty right. big landslide for yes. Mm. And it was right. mainly... And you know what's interesting about, now that you're mentioning a vote no, it was Sorry. mainly also Labor seats that, that voted no, um, not uh, uh, Liberal seats where, um, you know, most of the, the no MPs come from, uh, most of those voted right. yes. Yeah, no, absolutely. But you know what's interesting uh, enough is that uh, you, you, you cited um, a vote no, um, what's it called? A, a place that voted no that has a gay MP. Which I think is one of the most interest, more interesting things, and I think conservatives uh, also mm. need to, to get on this train. Is basically how about making sure that people understand that maybe just because you don't support gay marriage doesn't mean that you have a problem with gay people. So much so that you wouldn't have a problem with a right. or a gay yeah, person but, but, but as long as their point. ideals are Because voters are largely Excellent ignorant. They, they probably don't know that he's you know gay. Like they just like. You know, vote really? Labour because that's what they normally do. I, mm. I think that's unlikely. I think most of the electorate would have known his his uh, sexual orientation because yeah. it's it's usually trumpeted from every roof, especially in the media. Um, and and, everyone and that's where most voters get their information from. Yeah. It's, <laughs> Yeah, in the seat of Brisbane, you know, right. both candidates for the major parties were homosexual and... Um, it made no difference because that's what the electorate wanted. Um, and they, Brisbane voted overwhelmingly for it. It was the highest result uh, um, for for the Yes campaign. But it's an excellent um, point, Emilio, that that's a great example of saying, look, there's this seat that voted against redefining marriage, um, but they have no problem with a homosexual representative f for their seat. And it's, it's separate issues. The idea is not the individual. Exactly. We, that, that, I think, is one of the more important points, and I think that's one of the things that a lot of people haven't caught up on, is that, honest to God, we don't give a shit. You know, is if you're trying to infringe on other people's rights and you're trying to basically exactly. bully everyone into thinking that they're horrible people for not agreeing with you, that's when we're yep. going to take issue. But we don't care. Be gay. Whatever. <laughs> like, that's, that's right. Your Whatever business. floats your yeah. boat. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, people would say to me, oh, you know, stay out of my bedroom. I'm like, Stay out I don't of my want parliament. To be in your exactly. Yes. I, I'm not there. You made this a public issue. Exactly. I'm not trying to get into your bedroom. Believe me. <laughs> totally. <laughs> uh, so we'll have a look at Queensland now, um, which is okay. I I interesting. The, the more whiter uh, uh, the the population gets, the the more overwhelmingly yes. So there was only two uh, electorates mm -hmm. which voted no. Um, right. oh, there might have been. Hang on, if I just look. Um, if it's uh, Morona, I'm not sure where that is. They voted over 56% uh, no. Uh, Bob Catter's electorate, 53% okay. uh, no. So, you know, Bob Catter uh, been a strong uh, uh, opponent. So it looks like he read his electorate uh, quite well. That only, yeah, that, that was the only, even if we have a look at Dawson, which is George Christensen's seat, they voted 55% yes. Capricornia, which is wow. next door, they voted uh, yes as well. Brisbane, yep, as we mentioned before, overwhelmingly yes. Uh, so Queensland... Leichhardt's a big surprise. Leichhardt's a, uh, a fairly, um, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm getting confused, right... Right voted, yes, they're a very conservative seat. Um, mm. Yeah, so like, yeah, like is, well, oh, that Warren Inch is the MP. He's he's been a, a supporter of same sex marriage since uh, 2004. So, um, right. a rogue supporter. <laughs> Wide Bay, which is national seat, used to be Warren Truss's seat. They voted 55% yes. Right. So t I, I'd like to ask maybe uh, your guys' opinion. You're 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 more in the in the um, Australian mindset than I am because I'm American, so I don't really understand. I don't really have a sense for how uh, the the um, legal system would work in this situation. How long from today do you think we're actually going to start seeing the actual push for voting uh, on the gay marriage bill? 
Like right today, we voted yes. Now we know that the majority of people, at least the majority of people that participated, want gay marriage to happen. Uh, what's next? And wh when is this going to happen? Well, it's a non-binding survey, so they don't really have to do anything. But obviously, you know, yeah. you ignore the will of the Australian people at your peril. So I think Dean Smith, the exactly. Senate, is sitting uh, this week, said he wants to propose his bill uh, tomorrow. So there will be huge political uh, pressure to uh, propose a bill pretty quickly. And uh, the deadline they've given themselves is, is Christmas. Wow. Is this like the worst time for it? Especially with the with the issues that we're having with everybody being ousted, because apparently everyone in the parliament has a dual citizenship. Like, is this is this just like the worst moment for this to happen? No, it's probably the best moment for Malcolm. Mm. He'll finally get to achieve something that his uh, lefty adoring masses will um, <laughs> con congratulate him for. Right. Um, he'll finally, you know, come some way to shaking off the shadow of Tony Abbott um, from mm. his critics. Um, so if it gets passed in the Senate um, this week, the lower house sits in the last week of November and first week of December, and okay. uh, the government would be very keen to put some kind of legislation to bed um, yeah, before the 7th of, of December. Uh, um, very fast. The, the delay and the complication will be what that legislation looks like. Um, and as I said earlier, it, there doesn't seem to be a will to protect freedom. Um, the, they'll just, the as simplistically as possible, change it. The moderates in the Liberal Party... Don't say will, moderates. Oh, There's no such thing le as moderates. Le lefties in the Liberal <laughs> Party. Uh, they, they will you. feel that they have, you know, the, um, you know, uh, ascendancy here because they've given the Conservatives what they wanted, which was uh, a vote. And now you know, they, they'll say to, you know, the mm. Conservatives, we'll give in, we've given you a vote. You know, it's clearly an overwhelming yes. You know, now... Now, you know, we, we're going to propose, you know, our, the same-sex marriage the, the way that, you know, we want it. The, the losers, uh, you know, uh, they might say, you know, shouldn't have the right to decide, you know, how, you know, same-sex marriage is introduced. And we've already seen the, the heavy hitters of the, the liberal left, you know, George Brandis, Simon Birmingham and Christopher Pine say that, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're not going to indulge their, you know, conservative, uh, you know, amendments mm. to uh, any marriage bill. Yeah. Look, if the Conservatives don't rise up and dump from pre-selection um, these hardcore lefties, which the media like to call moderates, George Brandis, <laughs> Malcolm Turnbull, Simon Birmingham, like, these guys are clowns. Seriously, there's not a, a Conservative bone in their body. They have mm. utterly betrayed every liberal value that Menzies would have stood for. Uh, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of political expression, for a business not to be able to conscientiously abstain from facilitating uh, a, a, an event that goes against their their moral convictions is is the opposite of, of liberalism. It's, you know, classical liberalism, I should say. Absolutely. It's, um, it's yeah, the, if, if those people get pre-selected again... Oh, goodness me. The the members of the parties need to be... You know what? Conservatives need to be joining those parties so that they can find better candidates who will actually represent the traditional Australian values that allegedly the Liberal Party once stood for. But the Conservatives will be weakened by this result. I mean, t uh, Tony Abbott did set the benchmark that, you know, 40% would, you know, demonstrate there you know, is a like, large Conservative movement. It's... Uh, you know, it, it's at thirty-eight percent the sure. no vote. So it's it's going to be, you know, like, looking at it obje objectively, it's this result is is damaging to you know the the conservative movement, and you know the the left uh, is is going to constantly hold up this uh, survey to say that yeah. you know, you're in the you're in the minority. You know, why should we listen to you? Look at look at look at these results. Right. Yeah, I don't know that I'd call it as damaging as you do. It's interesting. It's interesting. Uh, I am interested that you that you think it's so damaging. I would have thought thirty eight is close enough to the forty that shows there's a uh, there's a. I don't I don't think it's so binary as forty fantastic conservative support, thirty eight no conservative support. I mm -hmm. I think it, they should still be really serious with this kind of. They should be seriously concerned with trying to be faithful to this large portion. It's 30, 38% of the Australian population said no. Now, right. what what kind of part 
of the Liberal Party do you think that is when currently only 45% of the nation would even vote for Malcolm Turnbull? Like if 38% of that 45% have said no to homosexual redef redefinition of marriage, that's a fair portion of the people who would vote right of centre. Um, ignore them at your extreme peril. I, yeah. Allow me to politely disagree that this is a really bad outcome for the uh, conservatives and libertarians in Australia. Uh, I, I'm just putting to you, you know, the, yeah. the arguments that will that'll be put to you after this result, because this is what, um, you know, the right. left will yeah. say. They, they, they will hold these... Exactly. Uh, and, and so I think that's what you've, you know, got to, got to, expe got to expect. And, you know, you've obviously put your, your defence there, um, you know, as to why, mm -hmm. you, you know, you still think that, you know, there's some good... And, and these results, but yeah, it's it, it's well, you have to admit it's still going to be you know to to make up that ground from you know thirty eight percent. It's oh, oh look, no Absolutely. no doubt today is a loss for conservatism. No doubt yeah. today is a loss for traditional Australian values. No doubt today is a loss for the Christian heritage which our nation was founded upon. Mm -hmm. um, but but um, you know trying to persuade the left that they should vote for the right is is always never going to happen awesome. they've always got criticisms and and they're rarely rational um they sound good in the echo chamber but they tend to wither in the light of day um so you know it's um yeah it's they're going to come up with stupid arguments um constantly um they're going to call us nazis constantly <laughs> Um, haters, bigots, homophobes, whatever labels make them feel better about their own virtue, um, relatively. So, yeah, yeah. Look, having this discussion, uh, I think the people we need to be trying to convince is the people in the middle, the swinging, undecided, open-minded people. And right. by open-minded, I don't, I don't mean convince every leftist policy. I mean actually, intellectually honest. Well, that's one of the things, and that's that's uh, you know my, my podcast is called Front and Center because uh, because I consider myself a centrist, which isn't even really a political point of view. I think it's just a worldview, and that's why I would say, uh, wouldn't it be everyone's responsibility to try to move more towards the center? So, in other words, yes, identify as whichever um, political um, whatever orientation you are. Yeah. However, can we all try to move more towards the center where we can kind of see the virtues on? other people's um, mind, sort of like the creme de la creme of every ideology, and start to yeah. debate among ourselves. Because it seems like right now, you know, we're talking about how, how bad opposition is. That's one, that's one uh, not, not really opposition, but how bad the opposition has gotten. How and how there's no common is, yeah. Exactly. Uh, Look, I think and, you're right if you're talking about where the argument should begin, uh, hmm. but I don't think the argument should end in the center. I, I think mm. that's how you get splinters in your bottom from sitting on the fence. Um, right. What you actually need to do is consider it with an open mind from the position where it's not personal and it's not spiteful, right. but you then move in the direction of truth, wherever that is. And right. I like the libertarian political spectrum of not yeah. left versus right, but up versus down. How big do we want the government to get? How small do we want the, right. our freedoms to get? Um, and yeah, I, the left versus right spectrum is just the wrong thing to be considering it on. Um, yeah. There's, you know, uh, yeah, let's start in the middle, like you say. Let's start in the centre. Yeah, absolutely. All bets are off. Show me the facts, the data, the evidence, the logic, the rationale. Can we exactly. consistently apply that to a multitude of scenarios or is this subjective, mm -hmm. temporary, shallow thinking that won't apply to any other scenario at all? For example, exactly. love is love. What a hollow argument. Goodness. Me. Absolutely. It's popular, but it's hollow. Because I, I think what they're trying to say is love is love. And they're referring to, um, obviously, to uh, gay rights. Um, yeah. But, you know, then obviously anyone can just take that uh, and mold it any way they want. I, I actually saw oh, someone look. commenting a little while ago on our Facebook feed that basically this is a stepping stone to pedophilia. Which yep. is, uh, and a lot of people say that, and that's obviously uh, one of the biggest loads of horseshit that I've ever heard in my life, because allowing two adults to do whatever they want uh, legally does not open the door 
to then let um, grown people, uh, you know, molest and destroy the innocence of young people. And that's one of the things that I think we have to start um, seeing is that just because someone is on our side, uh, speaking that way, that someone uh, kind of adheres to what uh, we consider ourselves to be, doesn't mean that we can't say that one of their opinions is stupid. I think that's one of the issues. That's something that you see both on the left and the right, I think, is that since they're on our side, we're going to be uh, slower to um, to call them out until it becomes this huge national issue, in which case we're kind of pressured into it. But, I mean, if there are people that are, you know, pro-traditional marriage, they're saying things like this, that, you know, um, homosexuality is uh, disgusting and that it's going to, you know, make people start, you know, uh, molesting animals and babies. Uh, I think we should, you know, the people on the traditional uh, marriage side should be pretty quick to to say that's not what we're about. Look, there are better arguments and, and there are worse arguments. Um, and when many years ago, Cory Bernardi said it was uh, a short step to bestiality, um, look, I just thought that this wasn't necessary. It's such an easily refutable um correlation because exactly. obviously an animal can't have mutual consent you would easily come up with laws that would be consistently applied which would include one and exclude the other exactly however the love is love argument it doesn't easily preclude pedophilia we've seen an australian mm -hmm. magistrate the normalcy of pedophilia we've seen you know academics and you know yes, social elites in england argue the ability for minors to consent and he was they were attempting to normalize pedophilia it's not as big a step to pedophilia as it is to other silly arguments um and so i i probably encourage you to come back to the center on that particular yeah. argument like you know what look at the look at the evidence um around the world you know adult incest is another one that horrifies people you would equate it but it's very mainstream. You've got a court in Germany that's ruled yeah. in favour of uh, not a not a court, but the uh, the Human Rights Committee or, or some, yeah. some kind of you know really high powered people like that saying mm. you know it's unfair to discriminate against these people. All all they want is to love each other and have the same rights to love and marriage and have a family as everybody else. Right. It, you know. Um, you know, a brother and sister who'd never met each other in their entire life, fell in love, had a relationship in their 40s and discovered years later with children that they were related. Um, and they're you, saying these examples prove we should include these people um, in society instead of discriminating against them. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. They're using yeah. all the same arguments that the Yes campaign used, every mm -hmm. single same argument, and they're using it consistently. And this is why we have to say, starting from the centre... Is this a consistently applicable to other reprehensible things? You know, the Muslims would right. absolutely love to hear "Love is love" because they love their four wives, as the Quran commands and permits. Right. I mean, that that's not racism. That's what's in their scriptures. Yeah. Um, Fifty-six. You know, more than double the nations around the world that practice um, legal homosexuality. You know, have homosexual marriage. More than double the nations have polygamous marriage. It's not a ridiculous equation at all. Um, right. You know, so if I, I we have, I definitely think you know, can... that uh, the like uh, the the slippery slope argument, like it, it's applicable to um, polygamy, and you know, I'm a yeah. libertarian, so if you know, of uh, uh, you know, of uh, man, you know, is is able to you know ha voluntarily has you know two three wives. You know that's that's not really right. man's crazy. Well, it, it, it's, it's none of my business, really. If they're, if they're all happy, morally, for, yeah. if they, if they're all happy, then you know that's uh, uh, that's fine. Um, uh, but yeah, but I do think it's you know way uh, too much of a stretch to you know equate it with you know pedophilia, like because you know even though there so are these you right. know crazy you know academics who you know argue that you know children yeah. can consent, the reality is is that. You know, there, there's no way that, you know, pa like parents, for example, are going to be like, okay, like, you know, giving their children up for sex. Like, that, that, that's just uh, not going to happen. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not a large scale. Yeah. At and least. Uh, the, the same goes yeah. for, you know, bestiality. Like, everyone's just, dis you know, just dis disgusted by it. It's, it's never going to be, um, you know, morally. Uh, well, that's that is a invalid argument, bestiality, because the yeah. the argument for redefining marriage is the qualifications are you have to be um, able to consent 
it has to be mutual it has to be exclusive you know the the ability to enter into a contract is basically um basically the definition that they want for marriage if you can enter into a contract you can get Does married it be exclusive well exactly does it need to be? My- the terms of the contract could be very loose um but clearly a bridge can't enter into a contract Clearly, uh, a cow can't enter into a contract. Exactly. Um, Nor can a child. Nor can a child. Well, under um, our current laws. Yeah. And I don't think, again, I I think that, I think that, um, again, these academics that have said these uh, outrageous, ridiculous things about uh, children being able to to consent Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, expanding the, the rights of animals to consent, like PETA that, you know, sued on behalf of a monkey for copyright infringement, which is, you know, among the stupidest things I've ever heard in my life. Um, I don't think that those things are going to, because, you know, even as divided and as uh, polarized as we're getting, I think people still have a sense of uh, logic. You know, some may skew a lot to one side and a lot to the other side, but the real outliers, the ones that are such leftists that believe that you can marry a cow as long as the cow is a man and the the man is a man, then obviously they're not going to take over the culture, right? So I think that that's one of the what's it, what that's one of the important things to take into consideration. Yes, we might be getting more polarized, but I don't think that it's going to go too far. And uh, really quick on the point of um, of one man or one woman marrying several people. Again, I I totally get your your uh, your objections to it from a moral point of view, but it's hard to it's hard for me to think how that would apply to a uh, legal point of view. If I can sign a contract with two different business partners and it's both consensual and everything, I just don't know why there should be a governing body saying no. You can only do this one legal thing with one person. Why? Because there's no implications on other citizens. Um, you know, kids being raised in that kind of confusing household, uh, look, for whatever limited usefulness it is, there is loads of anecdotal testimony from kids who grew up in non-traditional households. And yeah. the the testimony of the damages that that has consor- con, you know, conferred upon them, I mean, mm. for a start, what power does the kid have to complain about it when they're in that lifestyle, The, you know, when they're in that household? the right. condemnation and the bullying mm-hmm. and the pressure from their own community is immense. And again, this is their lived experience. If that term is useful for anything, it's got to be useful for everything. Um, you just go to the website thembeforeus.com mm-hmm. and you will see loads and loads and loads of research and data and testimony of right. children who love their homosexual parents and love their polyamorous parents and don't diminish their capacity or value individually but they say i was deprived i i was lacking i was mourning i wanted something more what every other kid had and some adult made a decision on my behalf not through misadventure death divorce desertion right but deliberately decided to deprive me of my natural rights to be raised by my married biological parents um and that's the concern we should have with that right. type of contract is is because of its impact on others. Yeah, again, right. do what you uh, like. Do what you yeah. like. We're not proposing banning it or making those things illegal. Mm. But for the government to legislate and thereby signal normalcy is irresponsible and a, a failure of our duty of care. Interestingly enough, which is why we could have the government not legislate and just get get out of the business of it, right? Exactly. But on the other hand, uh, we also have the fact that, okay, yeah, uh, again, you know, you have um, people that live in non-traditional homes and they may, they may have some um, lived experiences that aren't excellent. But for me, what's really important is, uh, and we see this in, in gay marriage as well, uh, are they achieving well? Are they abusing substances more? Are they dropping out of school? Uh, do they have emotional problems? If no, honestly, I, I can't really... Um, uh, in which type of homes? That that's, sorry? In which type of homes were you asking? Uh, I'm saying just across the board, because what we've seen with gay, with, um, with, uh, gay couples is that kids seem to, to uh, function in their daily lives and in their future more or less the same as uh, just traditional families as long as they have two households. The only one, curiously enough, and this is, they say that this is a statistical error, but it might not be, is that lesbian couples' uh, children tend to abuse drugs a little bit more than, than usual, but... Uh, I, I, I don't know that, what that would mean. But my point is, uh, we don't, I don't really have the facts on polyamorous um, 
children that are raised in, you know, uh, households with many parents. I don't think maybe there's um, enough people yet to kind of draw the conclusions or there haven't been the studies. Correct. It, but, it wouldn't be a statistically significant study. Exactly. But my point is, and once we, once we have the information is, to me, as long as the kids are growing up healthy, not traumatized, not abused, and are not growing into uh, people that are not good for our society, then I don't have a problem with it. I understand how a lot of people may feel depraved. But, you know, we grow up with parents that, that, that you know, traumatize us all the time, heterosexual parents, and they can be wonderful parents and we can turn into functioning members of society. And we're always going to be lacking. So I don't know if that's enough. If um, having uh, you know bullies at school makes it uh, a justification for not having it, I was bullied at school, and I have a mom and a dad. So I don't know yeah. if that would be a justification for keeping uh, for keeping polyamorous couples from having children. Look, uh, as far as the secular arguments go, um, mm. there are plenty of cultures in history um, that have had polyamorous households. Um, there's a better case for that than there is for homosexual households. Um, but yeah, having, a, having said that, um, probably not under one roof um, mm. in the village. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> having, having said that, um, you know, I, to me it's common sense that, you know, all studies have confirmed the best outcomes are with the traditional family, married mum and dad. Um, and where you've got broken biological relationships, kids yeah. on average do worse. I, I think it's not a huge leap to infer that polyamorous households are going to have some disadvantages um, for kids. It's obviously not the law being proposed right now, but uh, if love is love... Then why not? Yeah. A lot of love is yeah. love. <laughs> oh, it's, uh, I, well, I, I'm not inconsistent on this, as I mentioned before, like... Um, yeah, right. like if you want to marry, you know, three people, then th that's fine with me. But the thing is, though, and this is why, um, you know, like uh, libertarians, you know, uh, like as uh, were comfortable, uh, you know, advocating for, um, you know, same sex marriage, but not for uh, polygamy at this time, is because, um, right. you know, they they re they realize that, you know, if community acceptance is a, an important thing as well and they they felt that the community mm. was ready to you know embrace uh you know, same-sex marriage but uh you know not um you know polygamous marriage but that that's Absolutely. you know whether like you know that slippery slope will prove to be like correct like only 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 time will tell whether you know in you know 10 20 years time whether you know community sentiment on, on that uh has changed Absolutely. And that's one of the important parts of this, right? That it seems to be that when this legislation passes, it's following the trend of the ideology of the community. And I think that you were talking about this earlier, Dave, when there was this, you know, failed experiment of kind of changing the, the rules of, uh, of marriage. It probably wasn't in a time when people were really open to that. And uh, I don't know, I, I really don't know, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call ignorance on exactly what it is that he changed uh, in terms of traditional marriage. But Let me I give you right? the, the brief one. They yeah. they basically banned traditional marriage. Um, they wanted ah. to to dissolve the family structure altogether, mm. um, and they wanted women to enter the workforce and not have traditional okay. roles um, because the industrial revolution. They wanted mm. um, the the uprising of the workers. Sorry, not the industrial revolution. The workers uprising. Right. Um, so they needed more workers. Um, gotcha. And and so you know, they literally became, it takes a village to raise a child. So the communist right. state took responsibility for raising your children. And instead of right. marriage, you had erotic friendships and mm. you, you know, a man could have 20 wives and subsequently, right. you know, how many children can you have with 20 wives and how many children can you fit under the roof? Of um, course. And so that's why it was a disaster, I'm assuming. Uh, Absolutely, and, but the, you can see how that's different. Uh, and I, I, I'm not, I'm not saying that you equated the two at all, but, um, but it does, oh, it does I, kind I, of. Uh, I, did, I did draw them, but I, I grant that they're not identical. Yeah, no, not at all. Uh, and I think that, that but this allude, this is, uh, this has a lot to do with what you were saying earlier, and that's when uh, the widespread and compulsory argument comes in. I mm. don't think that it will become widespread and compulsory, but I am very worried about having. Um, a society in which these programs, any programs relative to two people's choice, would be widespread and compulsory, right? That's obviously 
extremely worrisome, and I would stand next to you any day of the week in in uh, in opposing that. But uh, it seems in this case, uh, and I'm not trying to belittle your concerns about it, that when it comes to gay marriage, really what's happening is uh, basically gay couples who are now uh, who are now pretty much uh, accepted will have a right to sign a document that lets them get a bank account together and mortgage a house together. They're already in relationships. Like the, the, the gay relationships already exist in the public eye. They're already a part of society. Now mm-hmm. all they're going to be able to do is sign a document. So I don't think it's as much of a slippery slope uh, societally as uh, as maybe uh, some people think it is. However, it might be legislatively an issue. Yeah, agreed. The legal ramifications will be far and reaching. Um, the yeah, the homosexuality is already normalised in in Western culture. Um, this isn't going to change that at all. Um, right. The you know, I've done an interview recently with some um, gay LNP members, um, okay. students at University of Queensland, mm-hmm. and their personal testimony is they experienced zero bullying growing up and coming out as yeah. gay in Australia. In fact, the bullying that they experienced and the vilification, the hate, that the loathsome behaviour that they experienced was because they were conservative. Absolutely. Um, you know, so no, this isn't going to make life better for homosexuals in Australia. It's not going to change anything. It's not going to change their mental health rate. It's not going to change uh, their social acceptance. Everything yeah. will will stay exactly the same for them. What it will change is the potential for weaponization of anti-discrimination law against Absolutely. people that disagree with the new orthodoxy. Please like, comment and subscribe. While you're here, grab our free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and visit theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.